What's up, guys? And we're live. Myron Gaines here with Rolo Tomasi, the legendary author. This is going to be a good one, guys. Game theory and application. Let's get into it, baby. The man has, needs no introduction, man, but I just got to – I man, today's a very special show, guys. I got the legendary author, godfather of the Manosphere and the Red Pill, Rolo fucking Tomasi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we're, and today, guys, we're going to talk about um, obvious, uh, Rolo's past, uh, how he got into what he does now with uh, pretty much becoming an expert when it comes to intersexual dynamics. Um, no one has broken down the word hypergamy more. And this man right here, he has four, the fourth book is on the way. He has three books right now. And I'm just, if you guys have been living under a rock, I mean, I'm just going to, I'm going to have Roland introduce himself to you guys. But before I do that, uh, personally, guys, like the books have changed my life. You know, I've read them. Uh, I actually have a hard copy of the first Rational Mill, which I pass out to my friends that actually want to learn and read this stuff. Uh, only in emergency situations when they're ready because you shouldn't be giving that type of content to people unless they're ready to read it. But, uh, you know, the book has saved many people's lives. It's taught guys the uncomfortable truth about intersexual dynamics, and, and it's impacted me great because for me personally, I grew up in a Muslim household, so I kind of knew these truths. But reading the book actually helped me put the dots together finally to understand why and the theory behind, um, you know, how women operate, how they may select, etc. So without further ado, man, Rola, please tell the audience – about yourself as we, we've already been on real zero so many times and stuff. <laughs> I, I didn't really, really had a formal introduction i guess um i'm the author of the rational mail the first book uh which is a multinational bestseller everywhere people have referred to it as the bible of the manosphere the bible of the red pill um and uh two other books uh which are in the series i once i did the first book i decided i was going to do a series because i had other people asking lots of questions based on the information that was in that book and i felt like i needed to do a few things so like when i did the series of books it was usually sort of in response to people asking me questions about material that was in the other book so i figured i needed to do a supplement book so i did one called uh, preventive medicine which is the second book and that's based on a timeline of what guys can expect um uh, from women or from the average woman let's just say in a western westernizing culture um and w w at various phases of maturity what they're looking for how they prioritize their their at least dating lives or their, their sex lives their personal lives everything else um and then on uh let's see uh summer with july of 2017 i uh, published uh positive masculinity because I had so many guys asking me about um, questions about how applying the red pill to their marriages, applying the red pill to uh, parenting, um, they're they're you know raising their sons. I had so many guys asking me, they say, when should I give the rational mail to my teenage son? I don't want him to, you know, go down the path that I did. And I was like, well, I don't know, you know, is he a reader? <laughs> I don't. So I, I had so many of those that I decided I was going to do positive masculinity, and so the first half, of, well, first third of that book, maybe two thirds of that book, is uh, is about parenting, red pill parenting, and then the other, the remaining part of it is uh, a, really a dissertation on uh, how masculinity has sort of crumbled and how we can sort of bring it back from the brink. I think. So. Now, uh, Rolo, can you define? Because obviously, uh, the red pill is a loose term. Uh, some people misconstrue it. Um, I, 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 I like that. That's actually, I'm keeping that one. I know that was a flub, but that was good. Uh, nice, nice. Perfect. Screw it. Yes, they well, do. Finally, finally, I, they do. <laughs> finally, I could contribute something. Um, yeah, so a lot of people misconstrue it and um, use it to fit some other thing. Can you, uh, can you define what the red pill is as far as it applies to your work and then also tell us how you got started in writing and, and putting out mm -hmm. the type of uh, content sure. plan? Um, I am. Um, I have to. I I usually like to give credit to Tom Likas from way way back in the day. Tom yes. Likas used to have a terrestrial radio show. Uh, I became aware of him right around 2000, 2001, somewhere around there, and uh, he was still had a 
terrestrial radio show. I used to listen to him in the evenings on my commute back from work. And I was just like appalled at this guy. And I didn't realize why I was appalled at that, what he was, what he's talking about, because up until that point, I was very much still kind of stuck in this, um, this idea of, uh, what I'd been taught about egalitarian relationships. And, and I just thought, okay, this guy's just like slinging red meat here, but he wasn't, I mean, his delivery was very rough. And I, people ask the, the, the one thing guys always ask me, this is when did you get red pilled? Right. And for me, it wasn't really one particular uh, incident per se. It was like a series of incidents. Uh, I had had dealt with a, a girlfriend for almost four years who was borderline personality disorder. That was one part. And then during that time, I also read a really great book by uh, Dr. Warren Farrell, which was called uh, Why Men Are the Way They Are. And um, I, get, I got my coffee coming in here. Um, yeah, always, man. And uh, so I, I I read that book while I was while I was with her, and that sort of woke me up to a lot of things, at least as far as like women's nature and women's mentality. Uh, got out of that relationship. That was that was sort of like I think that was the beginning of it. And then I, I listened to Tom Likas for a while, and then in 2003, my uh, my brother-in-law, who was the husband of my wife's sister, ended up committing suicide as a result of a her divorce which of course it was like the beginning it was like the end of everything for him and so i mean without going into too much details that was it wasn't so much the suicide that that like made me think about things it was the people's reaction to it like mm -hmm. the post like, suicide like the people who are like trying to explain it to themselves and even absolute strangers like were taking like i i knew right there and it was really tough because i i hadn't really formed the ideas that i have now but back then, like it was, it was like an Anthony Bourdain situation where um, uh, the the girlfriend or the wife or whatever had got with a guy who was visibly, clearly more either alpha, more rich, or you know, just like a, a higher caliber of a guy, and stepped in and and essentially ruined a marriage and ruined a family and ruined all this other good stuff that was going on. That the guy had done everything right for a long time. And this came at the same time that I was also studying behavioral psychology and I was doing peer counseling with guys who I was doing peer counseling with men who nobody wanted to, to take. And I did it just because it just sort of fell to me to do it. Now, you know, here I am in my early thirties. I'm talking to guys who are like in their sixties, like 65, some of them eh, 55 to 65, let's say. And they were all very, like what we would call simps, blue pill beta guy. Like today, that's what we would call them. I didn't have a name for them back then, but I started talking to these guys and they all had the same problems, which was, oh, you know, if you should just tell me what I should do, I'll, I would do it. And, and uh, they just didn't understand the nature of women. And so I was at the same time, I was also writing for So Suave, which was my, my forum for a very long time been a part of so suave i still to this day lurk on so suave i was a moderator at so suave from 2002 well i was a yeah about 2002 until about 2015 and i just couldn't keep up because i was doing so much with the blog and i was doing so much with the books and everything and i i, I just couldn't keep up but i still lurk there because i think it's a great uh it was a great is was and is a great resource a great forum uh so suave is a forum it's one of these old uh seduction forums Mm -hmm. And uh, between so suave and um, and like alt fast seduction, alt fast seduction was like RSD's old server. Mm, yep. And, uh, and mystery method in that. So I would fluctuate between those and a couple other ones that are like gone now. And um, so at that point, when I was when that had happened, that sort of woke me up to a lot of things that was going on um, as far as. Uh, the nature of of you know the blue pill we we, st we didn't even really start calling it the blue pill until about 2002 i can show you but i can show you some of my earliest forum posts where we started talking about unplugging in the red pill as far back as 2002 so like when when MGTOWs go yeah man the red pill we, you don't know what the red pill is it's like dude i was there when it was first coined so i uh, yeah i do people say that yeah it, how do you and, how do you define it then, uh, Rolo? As far as like um, the the red pill, since so many people, I, I have um, and this is the the way we used to talk about it, and this is the way that I still refer to it today, is the red pill was a comparison because we we used to before we even talk, we, we didn't even refer to it as a red pill. We refer to it as unplugging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we made comparisons to the Matrix. 
So, and because it was an apt, you know, comparison at that time. And so when we, when a guy was sort of plugged in and he was what we called an AFC, right? An average frustrated chump. Yep. That wasn't a beta. There was no beta males. There was no blue pill. It was average frustrated chump. And you'll find that in like books like The Game by Neil Strauss and even a lot of the literature and the stuff that, that Mystery was talking about way back in the day, like 2001, 2002, 2003, somewhere around there. And that was the, that was the term for guys who were plugged in. And so on SoSwap, we sort of made the comparison that's like being plugged into the matrix. And then that's where the red pill sort of came from. So to me, when we talk about the red pill, it's sort of unplugging from your old conditioning and your old way of thinking about, uh, about intersexual dynamics, about gender, about, uh, you know, women's nature, men's nature, egalitarianism versus like, or toxic masculinity and all the stuff that you've been taught from the time you were like a really young kid. Like, and, and I know because I'm generation X and I would have, I, I would tell you right now, like by today's definitions, I was very much blue pill right up until I was about 19, 20 years old. Mm. And even I still hung on to a lot of the, the idealism that was there and it took me a long time to really just sort of unlearn that. And so that's really what the comparison is or when we started talking about it in terms of red pill, blue pill. Um, it was guys who were cutting themselves away from this old way of thinking about women, about themselves, about what they, what, you know, if you had a really strong father, maybe it seemed like, well, well this is just lame, you know, who doesn't know this? But there's generations, there's, I would, I would argue there's at least four generations of men who've been conditioned by what we call the blue pill. That's why I keep referring to it as blue pill conditioning because it's a psychological conditioning. It is a, it's preparing boys as, or, uh, you know, I, I keep using the, uh, the age five years old. I have to explain why I do that because at five years old, that's when a child is like a sponge. And that it, it picks up, uh, that kid picks up everything around it. You, you, you'll hear child psychologists say this all the time. Like if you're a four, five, six-year-old kid, right around that time is when they learn the most of anything that they learn. And everything else is built upon whatever the basis is that they learned when they were five. So that's why I keep using that. So from the time a kid, like a boy is five years old, he's, he's, he's like a sponge and he's taking in all of this. Oh, you got to be nice to her, uh, you know, carry your books home from school. It's like, that's the point at which most guys Either they become sort of more natural alphas or they have that natural alpha kind of crushed out of them. And so I was, that's why I refer to it as blue pill conditioning, because when a guy who has been trained and has been con socially conditioned and psychologically conditioned when he's five and then 20 years later, he's 25 years old and he's going through a breakup and he doesn't understand why things are happening to him or why he got into that situation. That's why I say it's blue pill conditioning to condition you for, to be serviceable, to be a, a kind of a guy that works best for a gynocentric social order. And that, you know, things pile on after that. But whenever I refer to blue pill, I call it conditioning. When I refer to red pill, I, I refer to it as sort of like unlearning that or cutting yourself away from that. And that was the original intent of what the red pill is really to me is intersexual dynamics, uh, understanding women's nature, understanding your own nature as a man, understanding conventional masculinity and conventional femininity rather than this learned crap um, and understanding things in terms of the data that we have today, which really kind of started, I, I want to say it was like the mid or the late 90s up to where we are right now. So you're looking at maybe like 22, 25 years of aggregating all of this information that we call the red pill, that we call the, the manosphere. And because it was popular and because it was easy, it's turned into this kind of like the red pill itself has turned into this term for truth. And so whatever your subjective truth is, whatever your ideology is, whatever your politics are, whatever your religion is, that's the red pill now. It's like it, it's it's the the term is essentially meaningless, but it started out specifically in the pickup community, in the seduction community, in the what we call the red pill community, like understanding these things. And I have referred to the red pill as a praxology because that's really what it is. Mm -hmm. People want to make it an ideology because that's the only way they can interpret their world. Yeah, exactly. through, the, through, oh, it's got to be an ideology or it's got to be this or it's a, it's a bias, it's that. It's like, no, it, it, it certainly didn't start out as that. And I can understand why people say that about sort of like the sub- tribes or the subcultures of the red pill in the manosphere yeah those are definitely ideologies but in its purest form 
in its original intent, the red pill was about intersexual dynamics. It still is as far as I'm concerned, but everybody wants to say, you know, the alt-right, oh, we're red pilled. <laughs> oh, yeah, we use, when we use the red pill as a verb, you know, something, something's changed. <laughs> you know, I got red pilled. Oh, how do you do? How do I get red pilled? Let me, let me, t- here's my gum road program. I'll teach you how to get red pilled. Yeah. And it becomes something about like, uh, I don't know if, are you familiar with Candace Owens? I'm not, I'm not a pundit, a uh, black woman, very smart, very on top of her game, very much, very much a moralist. Uh, very, uh, she's done stuff for, uh, she's been on Fox news. She's been on uh, Prager U and that kind of stuff. She originally started out by calling herself red pill black. And now she's kind of stepped away from that and kind of moved away from that. But red pill, it's, it's the Cassie J movie. Now MRAs want to call themselves red pill and MGTOWs want to call themselves red. Pill. Everybody's everybody. We all get to be red. You get a red pill and you get a red pill. And you get red. Even, uh, man, who, what's, what's his, uh, the guy that the owner of man is, it's, uh, of, uh, Tesla. Oh my God. I'm losing his name right now. Elon Musk. Yeah. Yeah. Elon Musk. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Even more. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Yeah, when he when he said take the red pill. Yeah, and I got like a bunch of retweets. Real quick in the super chats, uh, Donovan Sharp in the house, man. Twenty four ninety nine, rock solid duo right here. Thank you so much, Donovan. As always, man. Guys, go sub to Donovan. Get on his Patreon so you can get all the crazy stuff we say on the seven because he has to take it off YouTube. Uh, CEO lifestyle. This is my boy right here, business partner that I do the Fresh and Fit podcast with. Tom Lyka saved me. Any foundation uh, from him is essential. Shout out to Rolo. Yeah, he's a big fan of your work too, man. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we got Rinaldi, uh, Rinaldi. Yeah. Rinaldi just wanted to show some love. Both of you, uh, to, to love to both of you, my brothers. Hey, Rolo, please check my email. My man bumped into a few times already. Take sure. it easy guys. Um, and that, that ends the super chats. Okay. Sorry. So yeah, man. Yeah. It's definitely gotten more mainstream and people are using it, uh, pretty loosely. Now. It, it turned into a, a loose brand. Mm-hmm. And that really was, I always knew that was what was going on because we we're, we're kind of living in what I call the hustle economy. What we're doing right now is really part of the hustle economy. Mm-hmm. And the red pill was a, it was trending on, on Twitter, trending on YouTube. And so everybody jumped on board with that. That's why uh, when you look at the, the movie, the red pill by Cassie J, it's not, it has very little, has yeah. nothing to do with the red pill. Yeah. It has nothing really to do with the MRAs that she claims are are you know the the people that she was focusing on it's really about her mm-hmm. and that's exactly what i said was going to happen back in 2015 when i that movie got floated out and she made appeals to milo yiannopoulos and mike cernovich and the manosphere in general so that she could do a uh, a kickstarter or she could get some sort of fun you know go fund me so that she could do the distribution of the movie that movie would not exist had she not pandered to the manosphere in the terms of by putting red pill as the title of that movie so it had very little to do with that in fact almost nothing to do with what i would say is the red pill but you know that that people jump on it because they think that it's that that's what it's about and every time you see the red pill in mainstream media they will always conflate it with the men's rights movement it'll be mras or it'll be incels now or it'll be uh mig towels are getting conflated with the red pill as well and again, the red pill is just a praxology. It's just the nuts and bolts of things. And I'll say this because it definitely is becoming more mainstream. And I'm glad that we touched on this. Uh, shout out to Atham Alda, uh, Aldeca, De- Dequa with the super sticker, uh, $2, $2 mm-hmm. sticker. Thank you so much. Um, recently, uh, you, you know, Dr. Phil reached out to you. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we know pretty much that when, and they reached out to Donovan as well. Mm-hmm. And when I, I kind of called it that like this, the, you know, there's going to be a change coming where, you know, more men are going to wake up than ever before. Because what I've realized is you guys know, I'm here in Miami, uh, you know, doing my thing, 30 years old, whatever. So I'm like old enough to like kind of see things, uh, how the world's changing, but still young enough to be in with the hip crowd and everything. And what I've noticed is that a lot of young guys are struggling with uh, meeting women and more and more guys are basically looking up. How do I get girls or how do I become more attractive, etc. And finding this type of content and figuring out the uncomfortable truths about how mate women may select. And as more and more people are waking up, obviously this is drawing attention to mainstream media. And Dr. Phil reached out to you and Donovan Sharp, two guys in, in the sphere that are very uh, prominent. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Whatever you feel comfortable disclosing as sure. far as that's, that's not a problem at, at all. Uh, I had done, um, I didn't realize this at the time, but I had done a, uh, you, you probably watched it, the uh, the breakdown video of Tommy Lahren's oh, yeah, absolutely about um, 
you know, how she's a, how she's not a feminist, but everything that comes out of her mouth is pretty much feminist rhetoric and and you know whatever. And so I did that, and I had no idea that that was going to make the waves that it did. I did the Will Smith video, the breakdown of him and Jadis Pinkett Smith on the red table, whatever that was. Yeah, that was very popular too. And I every once in a while I'll get a little golden egg from heaven that drops in my lap because that was like the perfect perfect storm for me because mm -hmm. it's like first of all it's got everything it's got uh gynocentrism it's got uh red meat for the guys who really want the red meat for it it also taught a lot of lessons even when i started that the will smith video out i was like okay we gotta <laughs> we gotta really dissect this well i did the same thing with tommy laren and tommy laren was a little bit easier because it was just her ra rattling stuff off She's 28 years old. She's starting to feel the anxiety that I broke down in book two in her epiphany phase, which is where she's at right now. And again, she is a she's the poster girl for this generation of women who are going to find it really tough um, for themselves. I don't care how famous you are, how pretty you are, how you know full of yourself, and how self you know appeasing and grand aggrandizing you are. It's going to be rough for even the nice girls very soon. And so I, I broke that down. And at the end of that, uh, I think that the producers of um, Dr. Phil's show uh, saw that and they realized that that would make some good fodder for their show. I didn't they didn't say that to me at the time. I got an email from, I, I guess, the junior producer or somebody. I, I don't know uh, exactly what his role is as far as the show is concerned. But the guy hit me up and he says, would you like to be on the Dr. Phil show? We're going to do a show. We're going to do a show on uh, masculinity in 2020. Mm. And I go, I'm always very, very wary of, um, of mainstream media. Certainly somebody of the caliber of, of um, Dr. Phil. And people, you know, people either said that it was a brilliant move for me to pass it up or else they said it, uh, I, I screwed myself. Like I could have had all, I could have had all this exposure. And so I, I considered it and I did a two hour interview with the junior, um, the junior executive. I don't know if he, whatever his position is, but one of the, one of the producers called me up and I spent two hours on the phone, just sort of being me, right. Tell, telling him what, what I'm about. And I, it, it struck me that this guy didn't know anything about me. He didn't know all he probably had seen is the Tommy Laren thing. And then towards the end of the interview, it's like, oh, we're going to have Tommy Laren on there. It'll be you and Dr. Warren Farrell, which I was, uh, that was really the selling point for me because I, I have kind of a love hate relationship with, with Dr. Farrell. Sorry, Warren, I, I still love you, but uh, I, I don't, I'm don't align with everything he talks about, but I thought, wow, how crazy would that be to see Rolla Tomasi and Warren Farrell on one side of the table? And then uh, Tommy Laren and some other random feminist, I don't know who he was talking about. He wouldn't tell me uh, on the other side is if we're going to have a debate and it wouldn't have been a debate with Tommy Laren. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> would have sucked all the oxygen out of the room. So I, uh, She's a brat, man. Chicks like her, like they wouldn't even let you get a word in. You know what I mean? Oh, so I um, I I waited a day, and they called me back, and they said, uh, he the same guy. He calls me back, and he says, "Can you uh, link me some videos of you being more animated?" Because the executive producer, I guess, wasn't sure that I would be able to sort of stand my ground or like be as animated as I would need to be. Oh, look at that in the room with Tommy Laren. And at that point, I go, okay. I know what they want. They don't. They don't want Roll Tomasi. They want somebody. They they want a guy like Paul Elam, right? They want somebody who's like frothing at the mouth and will lose their cool with with, with a, a twenty eight year old self entitled little you know biatch you know whatever. But so I I was like, this is you. It sounds like you guys want a blood sport, and I don't want. I'm this is not me, right? I'm I'm about to launch my fourth book. I'm not. I, I don't want to get into. Uh, I don't want to get in a pissing match, and I, uh, certainly not with her. And then second of all, uh, that's that's not what this is about. Because he kept saying it was, oh, it's masculinity in 2020. No, it's not. It's just you putting Tommy on there to to increase viewership of the, I don't know, the what's the demographic for Dr. Phil? Like 35 to 55 year old, you know, women at 2 p.m. You know, watching it, watching the Dr. Phil show still. Um, so I, I, I gracefully declined and the first person they called was Donovan Sharp right after that. And so I, that, that I led me to believe that they, I'd made the right decision. Donovan even turned him down as well. Um, 
And primarily, I was going to say is that uh, the last time I'd sense, seen something like this was when Roosh decided to go on Dr. Oz back in 2015. Yeah. And I was not going to, I'm not going to do that to myself. So I said, I, I have more integrity. I have more respect for my own work than to go and, and, you know, get into some sort of pissing match with somebody and, and then have to like have constantly have people go, remember that time you were on Dr. Phil? I'm mm -hmm. not going to not going to do that yeah no i'm like they definitely because uh i remember when donovan got the invite he hit me up and he was talking about it and i was like just be careful man because they're gonna try to do what they did to roosh which mm -hmm. you know for anyone that didn't watch that i i think you guys you know check out type in on new uh youtube roosh v and it was dr oz i think it was dr. Oz, and, yeah it would, he uh and and roosh knew what he was getting into when he did that i think a lot you yeah. know People always say, "Well, what's the you? Know, I'll here. I'll let you in on on a, on a secret here. And I'm really a secret, but like people ask me this all the time. How come there's bad blood between you and Rouge? Mm -hmm. And I don't really have a problem with Rouge per se, although I do think he is very much he has reinvented himself so often that it's pretty easy to see what his grift is. Uh, I used to have a lot of respect for Rouge. I think his early stuff was fantastic. Everything prior to 2015, <laughs> prior to the Doctor Oz show, was was really good. And I and I still to this day quote him like we were on Rule Zero, and I I was looking up some of his old stuff, you know, his predictions from 2010, what it would be like in 2020, and I think he was spot on. But at some point, he kind of just lost the narrative and lost his kind of lost his mind. And I think it really happened right around that time because he'd gone on Doctor Oz. And he got run up the flagpole. I think he knew he was there to get pilloried in that because here you have this audience full of fat women and suddenly he's the one who's the fat shamer mm -hmm. and they wanted him on there. I would say, I don't, I don't know this for sure, but I would say he probably got a good payday from that, that appearance on there. And uh, he said, he claims that he was ambushed on Dr. Oz. And I'm like, no, you weren't ambushed because a year prior to that, he'd actually done a, an essay either on his own blog or on return of Kings. And the title of it was Dr. Oz is a pussy. And you can go look that up on Google cause it's still up right now. And he did that uh, literally a year prior to him uh, doing the Dr. Oz show. And I brought that up. I said, you you're, you didn't get ambushed. You knew damn well what you were getting into. You wrote a full, you know, very long essay about Dr. Oz and how he's managed by his wife and how he's a pussy and all this other stuff. And yet you go on his show and you, you're going to claim you get ambushed. I, I mean, I don't begrudge him the money. Go go do it. If that's, if that's your shtick, go ahead. But don't say you got ambushed to everybody because you're trying to save face. And that's when he blocked me on Twitter. I'm still blocked on Twitter. I had when he dumped me from Rush V forums and everything else. And that's, that's really the story behind all of that, which is I just simply called him out on his bullshit and that's, he didn't want to have any loose ends, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So we got a super chat here from thought Terminator. <laughs> These yeah. names are hilarious. The $5 super chat. What's up guys? Did you see the salt Bay video? This guy's girlfriend twerks in front of him as the girlfriend bangs on the door. She belongs to the streets. No, I did not see that video, but um, I, saw I saw it this morning. Okay, I yeah, see all those videos because because what it is is like there's some 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 black chick was like twerking at some party or something, and her boyfriend but blows in through the door and says, "What are you doing in here?" And like start like chase. It's it's about like a seven second clip. Mm -hmm. I hate those things because the minute those go out there and people start reacting to it. They'll go. Oh, it was it was a setup. <laughs> no, it was staged. You know? Yeah. So you look like it's to, it's those kind of videos. I I don't comment on those anymore because the moment I do, they go. Oh, well, you don't know anything about these guys, and they it's really meant to to discredit people who want to jump to conclusions. Yeah, that's hilarious. And then uh, we got Bobby Sour Juice with the five dollars super chat. Keep that hustle up, big bros. Cheers. All right. So um, <clears throat> so you've been labeled uh, Rollo as the. The God and guys, don't worry. We're gonna get into the theory and application here soon. I know that's what you guys are all waiting for. Like, so tell us about how to get calls. Just do it. So don't worry. We'll we'll get into that because uh, me and Roll talk about this quite a bit as well. Um, but you've been labeled the the Godfather Red Pill. Um, how do you how do you feel about that? Obviously, you were one of the first guys to be writing about this. You, uh, Roosh and um, Pook, right? Um, yeah, Pook was one for sure. Um, yeah. Roycey, Roycey. I was part of the three R's of the Manosphere. I still refer to myself that sometimes um back in the day back in around 2009 2008 2009 um people started following me like extensively on so suave and they said you got to get a blog you got to get a blog and i resisted doing that for a long time on on so suave because i liked having the interaction like this 
you know, one on one. We didn't have like, well, I mean, I guess there was chat rooms and stuff that back then, but I really liked the forum format because it helped me develop ideas that turned into blog posts later. Um, and so people would refer to me as like one of the three R's of the manosphere. And I'm like, who are the other ones? And he's Roosh and then Roycey, and they both have blogs. And so I started reading their stuff. I started participating in some of their chats or their, their comment threads. And we were really the guys who were, I think, the, the forerunners of what became the red pill. And, uh, you know, we know what happened to Roosh. Roycey kind of, Roycey actually got uh, doxxed back in 2009 by one of his female commenters. And he was about ready to dump the blog, which was uh, Chateau Hartiste. It's now Chateau Hartiste. It was Roycey in DC back then. And, um, had a lot, if, if you go back and you look at those early posts, like from like 2006 to 2009 or 2010 on Roycey's blog or Chateau Hartiste, if you can find the archives of those, really great game stuff. But then uh, something happened and it became more about like ethno nationalism. It was very racial. It became very uh, anti Semitic. It became very political, became very, um, uh, very racial. And I was never about that. So I, and I, that was probably because of, well, just who I am and what my upbringing is. But also um, when I was on SoSwav, we had a rule that you never, you only talked about intersexual dynamics. You did not talk about politics. You did not talk about really like specifically about those things. And we were, uh, as a moderator, we would have to delete those, those threads. And so I, I was always of the opinion that I would do topics of religion, race, uh, politics, only if they crossed over into intersexual dynamics. And I still do that. And that's always been my policy, but it just got so racial and the, he was going to dump the blog. And then rumor has it that he sold it off to two other guys or, or like a, a group of guys who are doing the, because it was the, the number one most trafficked blog in the manosphere was, was Royce's uh, site for a very long time. And so people, gravitated towards my site, The Rational Male, because I stuck to game and I stuck to intersexual dynamics, whereas people were getting more and more into this. It was like just this side of like Stormfront or something on, on Royce's site with an occasional game post. And during that time from like 2009 till about 2014, people started calling me the Godfather of the Manosphere. So it's like, just because I've been in it for so long, I think that's what people did. I never refer, you will never find any reference of me ever saying like me calling myself the Godfather of the Manosphere. It's always been other people who've talked about that. But a lot of people want to say, oh, he's self-appointed himself. He's all, he's all about his own ego and he's a, he's got a Messiah complex. All I do is I, I just work here, man. <laughs> I just I put I, I I report back to you right I I I observe I hold up a mirror and you have to want to look in the mirror, and a lot of people don't want to do that they don't they would rather like try to tear you down or like say you guys you can't be doing what I've been doing for as long as I've been doing it, and not have people go oh man he just thinks he's so great he think yeah. Dude, I take shit just like anybody else, man. I just got back from walking my dogs. I mow my own lawn. Okay. <laughs> I don't have people do it for me. I do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome, man. So I'll, I'll say this. Um, so when it comes to hypergamy, there is no one like in the world who's written more extensively about female hypergamy than you. Um, can you give your, I guess your, because people like say hypergamy this, hypergamy that, whatever it may be. Since you've actually written on the topic and and pretty much like they, they need to adopt your because if you look at hypergamy on on Google, it just literally says the practice of marrying up. But you've broken it down mm -hmm. even further. Can you kind of give an, the audience an idea about that? So when you talk about hypergamy during your podcast, etc., people like understand what you mean, so they don't uh, misconstrue that as well. <laughs> I don't know if it's still this. I've done. I've done so many videos on people on the misconceptions and the misperceptions, the deliberate misperceptions of hypergamy for a very long time. Right now, uh, I would always, if if anybody really wants to get into, I'll, I'll, I could go on forever. Put it that way. I could talk about this for a very long time. Uh, but if you are really interested in this, I've got a post on my blog called Hypergamy: The Mis misconceptions about it and i wrote that in response to so many people abusing or or downplaying the importance of hypergamy so whenever i even say the word hypergamy everybody goes oh take a drink you know because that's that's what they think that i'm i'm about right and if you go and you if you type in right now and you search google for the, the term hypergamy i'm probably the 
uh, maybe I'm not the top one now, but I'm probably some, my, my site or something I've done is probably in the first page of returns that you're going to get. Um, because a lot of people picked up on that. Hypergamy became a really hot trending tag for a lot, just like the red pill, just like MGTOW, just like uh, semen retention, right? They're just like all of these things that, are, that are, are just basically what people are searching for, what guys are searching for right now. Hypergamy was one of those really kind of hot tags for a while. And so everyone either, you either love it or you hate it. So let me give you a, or just a quick background on it. When I came up with the, uh, the broadened definition of hypergamy, uh, I had, I had run across the, um, the term actually when I was studying psychology, because it used to be a term that was used in, it wasn't even a psychological term. It was a sociological term and it was used for the caste system in India when it, for some like studies that were being done. I think maybe even the eighties, they started using the, the term hypergamy and it was only limited to one definition, which was women's, uh, predilection, let's just say, or proclivity, whatever, uh, their, their tendency to marry up in socioeconomic class because they want to have a better life, right? You I mean, you're, you're, you're a sandwich artist, you want to marry a millionaire. And that was more or less the, the idea of it, but it was like specific to a sociological framework. And I came across that and I go, I thought this, and this is something I, I came up, if you can, if you want to go onto SoSwap and you want to search the term hypergamy on SoSwap, you'll probably find some posts of mine from like 2004 when I started trying to broaden the definition mm -hmm. because I paired that up with women's uh, innate sexual strategy or you know, mating sexual strategy, which is alpha, alpha seed, beta need or alpha fucks, beta bucks. I don't know if I can swear on here or not, but that the that's we we that's been in the manosphere forever right there's the short term sexual there is the breeding the uh the get the good genes side of women's sexual strategy and then there is get the good provider side so it, it and and mr used to um mr used to refer to this as survival benefits versus uh sexual benefit or versus genetic benefits hmm. and we'll get into uh, mystery guys later don't worry we're going to get into the mystery that was, that was, Two things. So women tend to like they would love the full the full package, right? They would love to get the guy who represents the best genetic uh, potential that she can get with, like the sexy sons theory. I don't know if you're familiar with the Red Queen or or the Selfish Gina. So, it's, so sexy sons theory, um, you know, writ large, right? She wants. That's why women like to have casual. They they enjoy sex, right? They they. It's why they want to have casual sex. That's why they we've never lived in an age where they could. Um, let's say, optimize that to the degree that they do now uh, without social stigma, without the buffers, without religion, that kind of stuff. So it was very obvious to see that there was, that was certainly a side of hypergamy. And then there's also the side that everybody recognizes, which is, oh, they want a guy who has the three Ps, right? Which is protection, providing, and parental investment. Those are the, those are the three Ps of the beta bucks side of hypergamy. And that's all, all anybody ever focused on because no one wanted to say, Women are sluts. No one wa literally nobody wanted to say that women will f will fuck up, right? They will they will bang guys to to increase their success. They will bang guys just because he's you know I was drunk, he was cute, and one thing led to another. Hot guy in the foam cannon party, Alpha Chad. That's all the short term sexual genetic benefit side of hypergamy. No one was saying anything like this back around the mid 2000s, 2002 to 2005. I started making that comparison. I said, you know what? We need to broaden the definition of hypergamy. And it needs to be more than just the a woman's tendency to marry up. And so I started using it in those terms, alpha seed, beta need. Uh, with that, those are the two sides of those. If a woman can optimize those two things in one guy, she can, she can settle what I call the hypergamous doubt, which is, is he the best I can do? That's hypergamy is based on one question. Is he the best I can do? That's really what it boils down to. And it might be from the terms of, is he the hottest guy? This is going to be the funnest dude in bed that I can like have sexy sons with, or is he the millionaire guy who had, who can, you know, uh, keep me happy for a long time. Who's going to treat me like a queen. Who's going to be a, a good involved father who, who is a, an upstanding gentleman, uh, a, an elder in the church, whatever owns his own business like that guy. That's the other side of hypergamy, which is the beta. We call it the beta buck side. It's really the provisioning side of hypergamy. Okay. And, and women look for those, those things in men at different stages of their lives. And they, at, at no other time in history, have they had the luxury of, 
looking for that in a guy at the, at those times. It used to be that a woman had to settle on a guy or had to get with the best guy that they are, their attraction, their arousal factor could get them when they were at their peak. Yes. When they when they were at their peak arousal, they had to say, okay, now I got okay, this guy's he's got good potential. He's and that's the thing about hypergamy is it's not it's never based on like the sure thing unless the woman gets to that point and she's like, okay, this unless it's very, very obvious. So what women do now is they look for either the short-term sexual side of things or they look for the long-term provisioning side of things, and they rarely look for it in the same guy. In fact, they don't even believe that it exists in the same guy <laughs> uh, right now anyways. Prior to all of this, when there were social stigmas and buffers, they might have. But after the sexual, sexual revolution, all that went out the window. Absolutely. So, I'm making this, I'm, I'm sort of coming to these conclusions here and I'm going, we need a broader definition of hypergamy. So I started saying hypergamy is alpha fucks, beta bucks, alpha seed, beta need, short-term sexual, uh, sur, uh, was it genetic benefits versus beta bucks, beta provisioning, long-term security potential in a guy. And if you listen to like, even today, if you listen to guys like Dr. Jordan Peterson, he will still focus only on that one side. Most people are uncomfortable, particularly if they're old school psychologists or their revenue depends on not revealing unflattering truths about women. And that's very unflattering to say you're a hoe until you're 28 and now you want, now you want to settle down and now your priorities have changed. I can say that as Royal Tomasi. Um, you know, Dr. What, uh, Dr. Robert Glover can't say that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, can't say that. Um, well, uh, Jordan Peterson can't say that because their reputation, their revenue, their business model, everything depends on, you know, oh, well, you know, men do it too. And, and so we have to have this, this balance. I'm like, no, they, no, they, that's not how it is. And you, you, you're doing yourself a disservice by only having hypergamy mean one thing. Oh, women want a guy who's who's upstanding and he's got a lot of money and he's got a lot of status and he's got, and that's all it's about. But that's not what it's all about. And 20 years after the internet has become sort of come into its own and social media and everything else, and our, this access to information we've never had before, it's rather obvious <laughs> to this generation of guys that they want Chad, that they want that guy. They want that guy who's hot and fun. And then later, when they're when they're ready to get off the carousel, when they're ready to cash out of the get, you know, out of the casino before the lights go off, that's when they that's technically when they get there to their epiphany phase if i say that i'm an asshole yeah if, if jordan peterson says that he's on joe rogan right yeah. he's the one and so i'll tell you uh, just just to, 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 to put a bow on this so i started floating this this sort of different definition like a broadened definition of hypergamy out there for for years for since like 2005, 2006, I've been talking about a broadened definition of hypergamy. I heard, uh, what was it? It was uh, Jordan Peterson went, I think it was the second time he went on Joe Rogan and he started referring to hypergamy and people started hitting me back on Twitter and they're like, he used the word hypergamy. Oh, I can't believe it. You're right. And I'm like, okay. So I listened to it and he did. And I was like, son of a bitch. He actually used the term hypergamy in the way that I I've been trying to get people to like broaden the definition for a long time. But then he only focuses on the beta buck side of my pergamon. I was like, God damn it, you know. But uh, that's that's really why. And and so when I talk about hypergamy and I talk about women's mating strategies, the most important thing to remember is like people think that that's all I talk about. Hypergamy, hypergamy, and people take it and they take it the wrong way now, and they misconstrue it. They think it's what I call a straight jacket. They yep. think that because and and this is really. Uh, really particular to the black pill and the doom pill and, and the more extreme ends of MGTOW is they think that the juice isn't worth the squeeze. And even if I got the squeeze, she, I'm just as good as the next guy who comes along and I'll be screwed. Mm -hmm. And women will just dump me and, and, I'm, and I'm fucked and I can't do anything. I'm like, well, here's the thing. First of all, that should motivate you to stay on top of your game, A. And then B, um, you're, you're not thinking about things. You're only thinking as women as being this sort of enigmatic, you know, uh, one program subroutine runs women's brains, right? Because women, when it comes to hypergamy are not, not all women are created equal. Okay. So a woman who is, you know, in our book, say like a five or a six, she can only optimize hypergamy up to a point. Yep. 
Yeah. And so, and, and that changes with age and as beauty declines and her ability, like I, I say this all the time and people lose their minds, but I say, you know, women's only real agency in this life. And women know this at the little back of their little hindbrain, lizard brains, brainstem is that their only agency in life is their sexuality. Facts. <laughs> Don't, 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 I had to I had to throw the horn on that one, man. Yeah, and that's why women when they when they want to protest something, when they're like they're in the riots, they strip down naked. Why? What yeah. we, when's the last let me ask you this? And even the people who are in the chat right now, when's the last time you saw a guy strip naked to per, to to get any kind to get any kind of attention drawn to himself? They, he'll be arrested and shot or or you know busted for like sexual, you know, he'll be a, he'll be a registered sex offender just for peeing. Just for a public urination, guys will get arrested for something like that, and you'll be, you'll have a sex offense on your because you somebody somewhere might have saw your wiener, right? Women will strip down naked and expect you to respect them and like I am God or ah oh, you know what feminism this or feminine whatever the feminine I think is the the thing, and you you'll look at that and it's like that's their first reflexive impulse. Why? Because they know that sexuality is the only way that they get attention. It's the only way that people, well, oh, you know, nobody, no, none of these guys are paying attention to me. If I take off my shirt, I'll, you yeah. know, p- people, and, and I write my, my, my ideological message across my tits, then people will pay attention. Why is that a reflex for women? Because men and women are different and women know on a subconscious, like evolved level that their only real agency in life is their sexuality. Great. Well, the problem is, is that sexuality decays over time. So you say, well, you know, she's going to get with Giga Chad and I'm going to be screwed and I'll put all this energy and effort into it. And I'm fucking, I'm out, man. I'm out. It's like, no, you think of hypergamy as a straight jacket. It's not a straight jacket. There's a lot of variables that go into hypergamy. The other thing is I get, I get criticized for is that I, they think that I taught, I, everything comes back to hypergamy. And the reason why they say that is because everything comes back to hypergamy in a gynocentric social order. You're goddamn right. It does. Women, women will legislate laws. To better optimize hypergamy, and I'll uh, say real quick, it is a matter of national security <laughs> that you know what hypergamy is about. And I'll say this too, because this guy just asked a good question: Is using IG now part of men burden performance? Albert Westcourt, the two dollars super chat, and I think someone else gave a chat because uh, Rolo's on a roll here, guys. So I don't want to really interrupt him. Right, yeah, uh, yeah, that, I, I, a lot. Of, like I said it's really deep. It's a really like complex thing, and so a lot of people just want to blow it off, and either they hate me for it. Uh, for talking about it or else they overblow it and think that it's going to ruin their lives. Yeah, no, man, uh, you're on a roll. Uh, Wando with the 10, 10, uh, I think that's Euro super chat. Greetings, non-self-appointed, LOL. Godfather plans to write a book in collaboration with Myron John Troy. R. Green did with 50 Rational Mail 2020 Vision. Myron, which program do you use for sounds? Uh, I got like a bunch of programs I use, man. But uh, but I'll say this, because Rolo, you brought up a good point, and then I'm going to turn it right back to you. When you mentioned that Jordan Peterson and these other guys talk about only the, the beta buck side, and they don't talk about the alpha side. You know, where, Meanwhile, you know, guys like us, we're telling the unfortunate truths. You know what I mean? Like I t- say it all the time. She belongs to the streets. Unless proven otherwise. But obviously, that wouldn't be politically correct to say that. And I'll say this also, uh, just because I, I love to, like, when you give the theory, I like to give an example of my experience. So... The other day, uh, two, t- literally uh, two nights ago, I went out with a girl. And um, when I went out with her, 100% like dualistic mating strategy. Like she met me and she was like, yeah, I already knew. And we, were, we got into the topic of talk- talking about tricks. And for the guys in here that don't know what a trick is, it's a guy that essentially pays for sex or a woman's time. He buys her bags. Basically, he spends money on a girl without her earning it. And she was telling me how she sizes up men and she's able to immediately – uh, is see men as, as tricks or whatever it may be. And she said, oh, well, when I met you, I, it was obvious that I couldn't like try to sit here and fleece you for money or whatever it may be. But there's like indicators when I see in other men that I'm able to like extract, basically I can extract resources from them, get Christian Dior bags, Gucci, all this other stuff, Louis Vuitton. And the thing I'm trying to say now is, is with what Rolo is saying is that we live in a world now where women are encouraged to do that. They're encouraged 100% to like, you know, uh, use guys for their financial resources while also having their fun with the with the alpha seed side. Because the thing is, is that with online dating and basically we're there's a sugar dating like epidemic right now. It's like a big thing. Like a lot of girls are on there looking to find guys that have the money stuff covered while simultaneously still living their party life or whatever. That's why there's so many college girls on these sites um, in general. So uh, and like a lot of guys will pay the money to hang out with these girls. So it's definitely like out there and I would say it's in your face before it used to kind of be like hidden, like, Hey, you don't like talk about this, but now it's like women are encouraged to do that. 
And we got one more su uh, super sticker here from Daniel Roman at five dollars. Uh, let me see. I think that's all the super chats. But yeah, go ahead, roll. I, uh, I think yeah, we covered everything. So, uh, I, I, it, I think that a lot of guys, when it comes to hypergamy, they 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 think it is it's a death sentence. They also think another in in misperceptions. I think, and like I said, some of them are deliberate misconceptions. Is that uh, that first of all, the, the first and foremost, they think that. Uh, hypergamy is a straight jacket like there's no way out of it there's there's no way it, like there's no way to turn it to your advantage well there is actually if you know enough about like you yourself have probably just done this before is you can use hypergamy that that the i guess the the format the framework of hypergamy can work in your favor if you know how to if you know how to leverage it um also is a lot of guys will think that it's uh, hypergamy uh is uh, men are hypergamous too right no you're not because men and women are different and we have different mating strategies. Mm -hmm. So for like a lot of guys ask me to explain this and they say, well, you know, men do it too. Or we all make comparisons. We're all looking for the best. Women will do love this one. You, you do it. And then I'll tell a story of like what I tell picks when I do it. Yeah. You, this is going to be great. Go ahead. So what they'll tell me is this is they'll say, well, you know, women, ooh, ooh, women or men do it too. Right. That's, that's the, the byline there. And it really comes back to blank slate thinking or blank slate uh, ideology. Like, well, if there's a, uh, if there, if men do some, or if women do something, then men must do something and it must be worse. Or, well, what do you think when men do that? I'm like, well, why are you asking me that? I, I will point out to guys when they say, well, what about when women do that? Or what about when men do this? I'm like, that's not what we're talking about, asshat. Yeah. We're talking about, we're talking about women right here. Why do you feel it necessary to hit me back with, well, men do it too, because you believe in blank slate equality. You believe in, in a blank slate equalism. You believe in egalitarianism. And that's the first thing. And so you're that's, and, and guys don't even realize they're doing this. I don't think is they'll, they'll become a white knight without realizing even red pill guys will do the same thing. And what about men? Well, that what about men? The what about ism is your is says to me that you haven't really unlearned the the blue pill you know idealism just yet. But when when I'm presented with that, I usually say this is that that's a false equivalency because men have a different innately have a different mating strategy than women do. For women, like I said before, hypergamy is it never seeks its own level. It always seeks it, it, something above it. And even when women get somebody that they think is at their own level, they're always looking for somebody that is above that. Hypergamy never wants to have just baseline, like a lateral move, right? It certainly doesn't want, they don't want to, uh, what do we call it? A, an attraction floor. Mm -hmm. Hypergamy doesn't have an attraction, has an attraction floor. Whereas for men, we don't have an attraction floor. Yep. I'm sure you've heard this saying nobody's ugly after 2 a.m. You know, like, guys will go slump busting guys will 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 bang fat women guys will like if you're hungry enough you'll go like uh, tom likas described it as this is like for, sex for men is like taking a piss yes he like, he gave a great analogy about going yeah, using a yeah. shitty urinal versus using like exactly. one at the like guys would love to go and take a leak in the Bellagio with gold plated faucets and a gold plated toilet and would love to, that would be awesome to do that. And any chance they get, they would probably do it. But when you got to go a, a dirty bathroom at the uh, uh, gas station works just as well. Absolutely. And that's, unfortunately, that's how got well, I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, that's how men evolved. We are, our mating strategy is this, it's unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. And if we could get that, we would. Yes. We could have that kind of, our, because that's what benefits our, our biology, right? With each ejaculation, we can potentially impregnate millions of women if we wanted, if that was the if we could, if that was some, some way to do that. Um, and here's so what most that, guys are scared that to determine that. our mating strategy. Go ahead. No, I was going to say like, and, and that's the thing, like you're so right, Rolo, because most guys are scared to admit that, that they want to get out there and date and deal with and have sex with a lot of women. The problem is that guys don't want to say that because they're too scared of what women are going to think. And then quite frankly, let's face it, Rolo, we know most guys can't do it. So mm -hmm. what they say, oh, I, I'm going to just date one girl because I'm, I'm a good guy or some BS like that. And it's like, nah, bro, the, like you just don't have the ability to do it. Why does Dan Blazarian have so many followers? Why do... You know, why do people love watching the Tates? You know what I mean? Because they're living a lifestyle, right? With a bunch of chicks. It's like unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. Exactly. They're like, Darian can have any one of those chicks anytime he wants. At least that's the impression. I don't know that that's for sure, but that's the impression. And that's why he's popular. Right. Um, if, and you then, if you don't believe me, just look how popular online porn is. Because what does it offer, guys? Unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. 
That's why it's free. That's why it's 4K. That's why it's streaming. That's why guys have a problem with it to the point where people can make money off of teaching you how to do NoFap. That's that's very true, man. And I'll say this real quick because you talked about blank slate equalism, which I, I'm going to give you guys. I love the theory. And I'm going to tell you, give you guys another example that I use. So when I'm on dates, I meet a lot of chicks that are feminists, man. I'm not going to lie. Like I meet a lot. And uh, my thing is, it's like kind of fun because when I'm on a date with a feminist, I'm like, all right, cool. Well, let's 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 see what she because some of them are like, I just want equality for women in the workplace. But I, I understand that a man needs to lead. Cool. And then you got the other ones that are like, no, women are totally capable of leading. We're equal. For those chicks, I love to say this. I'm like, all right, cool. Well, let's say me and you are in bed, right? And like we hear a b- big knock and you know a bunch of intruders break in. I'm not going to look at you and say, hey, I got the last home invasion. You got this one, right? No, you're going to look at me and be like, go handle that, right? Okay, so if I ask you for a fucking sandwich, I shouldn't have a problem with that because if I'm willing to die and protect you right in the home if something actually happens – then I need to know that if I ask you for a simple task, like make me some food, get me a drink, whatever it may be, I, I shouldn't get any back talk. And when I say that, they're like, okay, I understand, but that's still whatever. And it's like, you know, equality doesn't work between men and women. It doesn't because you're going it, to, it basically what I've realized is that a lot of women, and you talk about this too, Rolo, a lot of women basically want all the benefits of being treated like a lady while absolving themselves of the responsibilities of being a lady while simultaneously adopting all the benefits of feminism while also absolving the responsibilities from it and taking uh, and basically taking all the benefits of being a lady. Oh, I don't want to pay for a date. Treat me like a lady. But on the other hand, oh, I'm not going to make you any food, though, because you could do it yourself and we're equal. So it's it's it, a lot of women subscribe to this type of uh, how do I say this thought process? And it's, and it's, and it's, it's what I call the fempowerment narrative. Yes, and it's yeah. like women, women, female empowerment, fempowerment, the fempowerment yeah. narrative. It's been around since really the early seventies, I think. Mm-hmm. And feminism, the the what we refer to as feminism today, because it's militant feminism is really what it is. But f- the militant feminism that came in the post sexual revolution era is based on a, a, there's a prime directive for it. And it is never do anything for the express pleasure of a man. Mm-hmm. Because if you do that, then you're not an, a strong, independent woman. Strong, independent women don't need no man. Right. They want men, but they don't need men, right? That's the that's the the pretense anyways. And f- the militant, fem- certainly militant feminism, but like gynocentrism, feminism has been the, or- we, we've never known anything different. Like I'm, I have, I was born in 1968. Okay, I've never known anything different than what this social or this gynocentric social order has been about. At the same time, we're said we're we're told that we live in a patriarchy and then uh, this endemic sexism that hasn't really existed since probably the early '70s or has been etched away to where we are right now in in 2020. But women, it, just as you were saying, um, they under the pretense of equality. Uh, they are essentially seeking advantage. It's really a power play, is what it is. But um, but when women say, well, we're looking for gender parity, we're looking for equality, we're on women's rights. And I always say, well, what rights do you not have? Yeah. What rights you don't have? Because I can name a lot of rights that women have that men do not have. Mm-hmm. And the, the easiest one, of course, is, is mandatory, you know, it's selective service and, and mandatory subscription in this country anyways. That, that, that ends the conversation right there. You have more rights than I do. Because I have to, I'm, I have to require to put my life on the line for my country. If I want, in some states, if I want a driver's license, if I want, uh, if I want student loans, and all of those are available. Those are rights that women have because they have a vagina, and I don't have because I have a penis. Exactly. So I can, I can point out rights that that men don't have that women do, and. It, it, but that's uh, I could sit there and we can split hairs all day long. But that's not really what it's about. That's not the conversation. The real conversation is that. Uh, feminism, gynocentrism is the antithesis of women's evolved nature, yep. which they're looking for a guy like we want to say, well, women, uh, you know, I want an equal partner. I want an egalitarian. I want an equal marriage. I want an equal partnership. I want an egalitarian. This egal- egalitarianism seems really seems like logic to women because women tend to be more collectivist. They tend to be more communitarian because that's the way we evolved. Men were the hunters. Women were the gatherers. Women are the incubators of the next generation. And they are, if not the weaker sex, they are definitely the most vulnerable sex and have been so for millennia, for hundreds of thousands of years. Women have been the most vulnerable sex. That's why they look for the three Ps, protection, providership, and parental investment when they're looking for that. Yeah. So, 
And, and even when they're looking for the best genetic qualities, those genetic qualities have relationships to those, the three P's. But that's not what, that's not what gynocentrism and feminism teaches women. It teaches them that we need to have blank slate, equality of outcome, equality of opportunity, and we'll be damned if, it's, if we don't get equality. It's, it's just about equality. No, it's not about equality and because there is no such thing as equality. There's no such thing as equality, certainly not between the sexes, because what my advantages are, my innate evolved advantages are as a man are offset by whatever my weaknesses are as a man. And those are generally offset by women, complementary, complementarity wise by women. I can show you I can show you fMRI scans of how men's brains are wired and how women's brains are wired. We have the data. What we don't have is the willingness to accept the fact that we don't live in blank slate equalism, blank slate equality. Because if I want to say this, like, if, like, what is the, when people say, well, we just want a gender equality, I go, well, there's no such thing. And they're like, oh, you don't believe in equality? I, yeah, yeah, I don't. Because equality is defined by whatever the challenge is to that particular individual. So if equality means I, Roald Tomasi, as a, as a human male, want to have a baby, I'm screwed. That's, I'm, that's, that's outrageous. I can't have a kid. Oh my God. Because I'm a genetically, biologically a male. I can't do that. Guess what? You know who has a, a 100% advantage over me? A, a human female. So that seems very unequal, isn't it? Yes, it's very unequal. Sorry, you can't do that. We're not going to, and, and I wouldn't, it, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, absurd to say that, to, to, to think otherwise, but it, that's an easy illustration. There's a lot, like by order of degrees, whatever the challenge is, like, is it combat? Is it, uh, we're going to go and we're going to defend the nation. We're going to go out and we're going to learn combat skills. Men overwhelmingly are built for combat. We're built for fighting. We're built for aggression. We have more muscle mass. We have more testosterone. We have more innate aggression. We have there are, there are innate proclivities that men have that women do not, and vice versa. So, what's the challenge? Well, we need equality. No, so, you what you're what you're saying, and when people say you want equality, what you're saying is you want androgyny. You want uh, you want uh, blank. You want homogeny is what you want. You want a uh, a human being should just be a human being, and we still foster this blank slate thing all the time. We, we keep saying, oh, men and women are equal, and they should be, and we're just the same. Uh, we just have different plumbing. No, bullshit. We don't. We're, we're very much different, and those differences are much greater than we are willing to admit right now because we still cling to blank state equalism like a religion, like a safety blank, like a, a security blanket, and we don't realize that we're actually doing that. So I don't. when people say, do you believe in equality? It's like, no, I don't because you tell me what the challenge is, and I will show you how we are unequal or how we would be better together human men and human women would be better together than they are apart because I, my strengths complement my wife's weaknesses and vice versa. Wow. Guess what? We're better at raising children. We're better at living together. We're and, and if we both understand the complementarity between us in, co in conventional masculinity and conventional femininity, guess what? We tend to live better lives as a result of that, but we fucked everything up. Why? Because I don't need no man and MGTOW, I don't need no woman. And while you go to your side of the playground and I'll go to the, the, the boy side of the playground and never the two shall meet until we want to fuck. Yep. And uh, real quick with the super chats, mm -hmm. um, Albert Wesker is, is, using, is using IG now a par, uh, part of men burn of performance. Yes, it is. Um, we're going to release a course on this. Like the thing is with the way the social media age is now, guys, women need to see like a great Instagram. You got to portray a certain lifestyle. So Instagram is a way to run games. So I just, I forgot to answer that. And then we got a couple other super chats, Rolo, then we'll get right back into it because you're on fire right now. If everyone in the chat's going like uh, with flame emojis, um, Chris Von Eric, good afternoon, guys. Myron, keep up the good work, the great work. Shout out to Rolo. And then Terminator T 800, uh, thought term <laughs> men got upset for being cheated by a woman that they invested financially while a woman gets more jealous if man invested emotionally when cheated. Very true. Uh, da -da 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 -da. And yeah, and as we could see, Rolo's on fire. So, okay. Um, no, that is very true, man. Basically, the, the blank slate equalism, I agree with you 100%. It's, it, it, it's not, it doesn't work because when, you know, when there's times of war or it's just that men don't complain about the inequalities, but women will. You know what I'm saying? Because, because our attraction is based on our sort of maverick independence, our yeah. it, our competency, and women select men based on really two two different criteria: dominance and competency. Those are the two things. And if you are an incompetent male, 
you can never give the uh, like when I hate this. I when guys like say, "Oh, you need to be more vulnerable." You're, <laughs> no, that's weakness, and you know what vulnerability implies? You know, it's not it's not because you've been taught that. It's not because it's a social construct. It's because it's innate to men's understanding of women's nature. If I show weakness, it shows incompetence. Oh, I have a weakness. Oh, well, tell me, tell me, Samson, what's your weakness so that we might be able to subdue you, you know? <laughs> and it's, I, it, I mean, it, it, that's how old that, that idea is. And so when, when guys say, well, you need to be more vulnerable, you need to be express yourself emotionally. That's what a real strong, secure man does. No, it's not. And the reason why we don't is because we don't process emotion the same way that women do. Again, another biological fact of men's gendered brain difference. Hell, I, I was reading the other day an, an article about how gender differences are can be traced down to the cellular level in human men and human women. So yeah, there's there's a difference, and our differences are a lot greater than than a lot of people want to accept. But we've been a successful species, little critters running around on this planet for as long as we have, because we have understood our gender roles because we have understood what our strength are the complementarity between the sexes. And there's just simply, you know, it, I, I get it from both sides. I get it from the guys who are saying, we, you know, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. And then I get the, from the women who are like uh, a man, a woman needs a man, like a fish needs a bicycle. That's the same, same message. It's just, all it does is divide you and separate things. And I think it's, it's, it's hard to bring men and women back together because women have been fed this, empowerment narrative and this hubris and anything that sounds like you need to bust yourself you need to learn humility ladies anytime i'd say that oh my god i can't believe he's a misogynist ah! yeah. they lose their minds i'm not i'm not saying you need to enslave yourself in chains and you know, the hebrews and egypt i'm not saying that i'm just saying that you need to bust yourself down and be open and have some side kind of insight because women are not predisposed to having insight and let me say this real quick they, oh, because uh, again, once again, application with the theory to prove, to tell you guys basically what Rollo is saying is 100% spot on. So check this out. Let's go down memory lane real quick. <laughs> so last week, I was out with a feminist. <laughs> like, <laughs> last week, I went out with, with a feminist, right? And when we were out, you know, she, you know, she subscribed to a bunch of the, 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 you know, the typical feminist jargon, whatever it may be. And we got back to my place and basically I was unwavering and like letting her know that men lead, women follow, uh, you know, I'm going to pay for the date, whatever it may be, like, you know, get your your social construct thinking stuff out of here. Because at the end of the day, attraction is a choice, guys. You know what I mean? And and, you know, we ended I ended up closing the first date. And the thing is, is that uh, I close most of my first dates, guys, because about 90 percent. And the reason why is because. I don't let girls lead and I make sure I pay for the date and I'm in control of the situation every single time. I dictate where we're going to go, how we're going to do it. I don't tell her where we're going to go. I kind of make it a surprise and I close most of my first dates when I go out. And the reason for that, guys, is because even though women say I want equality and I want to have a say, of, a say in this interaction, they really don't. You know what I mean? They just want to look pretty and show up. And you tell them exactly what to do. I even tell girls what to wear when we go on a date. And I tell them, hey, we're going to be walking around a bit, wear something sexy but comfortable, blah, blah, blah. And they love that because the thing is, is that most guys don't have the balls to tell a woman, hey, meet me at this time. Exactly. Because guys are scared to make uh, a decision because it's looked at as toxic masculinity. I'll tell you guys another story. Uh, a few months ago, I met matched with a girl on Bumble. And uh, I told her, hey, listen. We're going to go out for drinks. I need you to, uh, and tacos, I need you to wear some comfortable clothes. Meet me at my place at this time, and we're going to walk over because I'm right here in, in downtown Miami. She's like, and she responded to me, oh, my God, that's so hot. You told me what to do. And I was like, what? Is this bitch fucking crazy? And so I go so I go downstairs, and I meet her in the lobby, and then I shake her hand, and I'm talking with her for a bit, and then I'm, it immediately clicks why she was so turned on. She's like a raging feminist from up north. And she was like, and it was very, even though, she subscribes to that ideology. She can't help but be attracted to a guy that's putting her in her place, telling her what to do and everything like that. Because here's the problem. Feminists typically attract beta males, right? The guys that want to sit there and supplement. They want to hear. Yeah, exactly. So when you're a guy that doesn't bend, you don't fold and you tell them we're going to do this, you're going to do that. They can't help but be attracted to it because they're number one. Women are programmed to follow a man. I always say women are fundamentally incapable of leading a man within the confinements of a relationship. But you're also like turning on that visceral attraction in the back of her mind 
because you're you're basically dominating her. And when you do that with with the feminists, both you know on the date and in the bedroom, they're gonna love you for it, despite what they might say. So you know, and here's another thing too. Sterling Cooper, I did an interview with him, which is on my channel. I clipped it for you guys. He talked about how female doms in the porn industry are frauds, and they don't actually get sexually aroused from dominating a man. They still want to be dominated, and those are the ones that need to be dominated the most. What they really get is like satisfaction from emasculating you, but that doesn't turn into arousal. So he was basically telling me how like female doms are also frauds. So, you know, this is all just to back what, what Rolo was talking about when it comes to equality being BS. And it's, it's true because women never want to actually be equal with you because by you saying I'm equal to you, you're inferring that you guys are on the same level. And quite frankly, just like Rolo said with hypergamy, women date up, man. So I just wanted to add the application to your stuff right there. Women cannot look up to a man who is her equal. A woman cannot look up to you if you are eye to eye with her, right? If she guys will say this all the time, oh, I'm not six foot tall. Yeah, well, that's that's you know, women select for height, they do. Women uh, was I think was it Patrice O'Neill who said this? I don't know. I'm I'm probably pair, I'm gonna butcher this, but like he was saying, you want a man like ladies, you want a man who is uh, makes 58% more money than you. That's Those are the statistics for uh, economically attractive men. You want a guy who is six foot tall, you have like the 666, right? Six foot tall, six pack abs, makes six figures, um, is better educated than you, smarter than you, wiser than you, uh, more motivated than you, uh, is out there, you know, <laughs> is more independent, like doing his own thing kind of you, but you still want him to be like part of your family. You want him all these things to be better than you so that you can call him your equal. <laughs> you, know, you want to know why women like I was reading I think this was like was it last year or was it the beginning of this year when I was talking about the the articles where or they did this study I think about how women were frustrated with men today because they couldn't find their equals like how men were dropping the ball because they're the dropout generation or the lost boys or they want to prolong their adolescence and they're not they're not the men that we, we need them to be now that we're in our epiphany phase and we've had our fun in the hot with a hot guy in the foam cannon party during our our college years and those guys aren't now around and it looks like we're going to have to you know keep up this security providing indefinitely and we might actually have to freeze our eggs and and you know they have their and you know they're counting off all these benefits that they have that men don't really have but they're frustrated because they can't find the guys who actually have prepared themselves to to be the guys the beta male providers that they were told would be waiting for them when they get to be 29 to 31 years old, somewhere around there. And that frustration comes from the fact, even furthermore, comes from the fact that they believe that they're looking for an equal. They're looking for the blank slate equal guy, the guy who wants to be uh, what Sheryl Sandberg has called an equal partner. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've used this quote a million times in, in my, uh, you know, coming up with hypergamy and estimating hypergamy. I've, I've referred to this as Sandbergian hypergamy, but Sheryl Sandberg, who is the C, uh, I think she's CEO now of, of uh, Facebook. Back then, I think she was a COO, but mm -hmm. she has a book that she, uh, that she published back in 2014, 2015 called Lean In. And in that book, her advice to young women about marriage and dating and everything is date the bad boys, date the bad for you, the commitment phobic boys, the the guys who are, you know, the hot guy in the phone counterpart. Ba basically date Chad while you're young, but don't marry those guys because what makes them sexy makes them bad as, as husbands. Instead, once you had your fun and literally it's pretty much affirming everything I'd set up to that point. When you, when, it, when the time comes, look for a guy who wants to be an equal partner and I quote, an equal partner um, who uh, wants an opinionated man who wants to do his fair share in the marriage and wants to be this you know, egalitarian ideal in marriage. And, and then she says, with time, nothing sexier. <laughs> yeah. Like, with time, yeah. yeah. So would that time be the time it takes for you to go from being at your peak sexual potential to being, you know, Karen at 38, 40 years old? Probably. That's so, um, it, it just it basically uh, confirmed everything I'd been saying at that point. But that's that's really it. Is like women they don't realize that, but they're sold really a blue pill for women. Yes, about like this is what you ought to be looking for. You need to have an equal marriage, but it's not an equal marriage if you want a guy who is more educated than you, who has a better job than you, who is taller than you, who uh, you know all of these things. You look at the uh, was it Royce used to call it the four hundred and thirty six bullet point checklist that women have for guys. Whereas for guys, it's usually, is she hot? 
and will she fuck? Those, yeah, exactly. those are the two things that got, that's your two criteria versus 436 bullet point checklists. And I'll tell you this too, man, because as women make more and more money and become more and more successful, there's a consequence to that, unfortunately. And that is your pool of suitable candidates is going to shrink because the big reason why Tommy Laren went on that big rant mm -hmm. as a multimillionaire, <laughs> successful yeah. Woman, yeah, as a successful woman that's worth, you know, two, three million dollars, her pool of candidates is really small. And here's the problem that successful women don't understand. The guys that you're chasing that you want that are that satisfy your hypergamous needs, those guys can date down. You can't, though. So they're basically playing a skewed game that's in the male's favor when it comes to high value. And the, the, like those guys will bang you. They'll deal with you on a romantic sense temporarily, but they're not really going to commit to you. You know what I mean? Because when when a guy works so hard and actually becomes it gets to a point where he's able to select women. I'm kind of like at this point right now in my life, you, there's no way that you're going to settle down because it took so much to get to that point that you're not going to sit. I always use this analogy. So there's a candy store, right? Girls are allowed to come in as soon as they turn 18 and they're able to pick as much candy as they want. They can stay there, get as much candy as they want. The boys, however, can't get in until they're about 30 years old and they have a certain amount of money saved up to get in the candy store. So by the time you get into the candy store 12, 15 years later and the chicks have already been there since 18, you're going to go crazy. Oh my God, I need all this candy. And the chicks are going to look at you like, oh, what's wrong with you? It's just candy. But the women don't understand that you waited out there for a decade plus to get in this candy store while they were already in with their one little lollipop. You're over here p taking all the chocolate, everything, because it took a while and you had to earn getting in the candy store. So when you do get in there, there's no way you're going to subject yourself to just one piece of candy. You're going to go nuts. And women don't understand that because women un fundamentally do not understand the plight of men. And going back to application, when I'm on dates, just at a, just to collect data so I can share with you, Roll. Um, I love to ask women, what percentage of men do you think are, are sexually active? What percentage of men do you think actually are out here meeting women? You know what all these girls tell me, men? 80%, 90%, 100%, et cetera. And it goes to show, like, and then I'll tell them, well, did you, do you know that maybe about maybe 10 to 20% of guys are actually sexually active? And they're like, what? And they're like, they can't believe it. And then I'm like, well, think of every time a guy approached you in a club and failed miserably and he was strange about it. It's like, okay, you know what? Now it makes sense. But the solipsism doesn't allow them to understand that men truly have to be made and it takes us much longer to get to where we want to go. But they think we're on the same mating schedule that they're on where we should be trying to settle down at 30. And it doesn't work that way because for a man to be attractive, it takes us so long to get to that point. So by the time we're 35 now, we're the 18 year old, we're in the candy store. We want to go nuts just like they did when they got in. So um, it's just very interesting to see that how women truly do not understand the plight of men, man, at all, like whatsoever. <laughs> I, and you're probably aware of my infamous uh, sexual market value peak years graph by now. I, I usually I did that. I did that graph as kind of like a joke at one point because I kept seeing all of these infographics. And so I put that out there. And really what it is, is it's I, and I'll just, in a nutshell, it's women hit their sexual market value peak right around 23 and men hit their sexual market value peak right around if they live up to their potential. They, they hit their peak right around 35, 36, somewhere in there. Uh, I have seen, I've seen the Huffington Post, of all places, say that men hit their sexual peak at 50, or sexual market value peak at 50, which I think is completely overblown. Uh, and then a lot of guys will say, no way, man, when I was 25, I was in much better shape and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's the only one aspect of what makes you valuable to women because women's sexual – their sexual strategy, their mating strategy is different from men. As I said, men's is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. For women, it's hypergamy. It's I want the hottest guy who is the funnest to have sex with and is the best sexual experience for short-term sexual breeding perspective and then also the long-term who has the best and who's the best investment for my long-term security guy. So those are the two like women tend to be interested in quality. They are what uh they're what biology and and uh, what uh, mating strategy uh, they would be called K selected. Men are our selected. Yes. Our, our sexual strategy, our innate strategy is our selection. Breed a lot. Have a lot of, have, you know, bang as much as you can. Our, our biology actually, like, what is it? Uh, John talks about this all the time. Ejaculate and evacuate. We laugh at that, but that's what, that's a result of men's uh, innate mating strategy. It be, it's in our, our biological evolutionary advantage that we have a lot of sex. That's why we have a higher libido. That's why testosterone makes us aggressive. That's why we, you know, when you're a young man and you're, you're, uh, when you're like in your teens and the wind blows and you get a hard on, that's why. 
because that's that's what you evolved to do and that's why guys have trouble with with uh pornography right now uh, because it's so widely available for women it's quality it's looking for the k selection it's looking for the best of the best is he the best i can do and so when women are at their peak which is at right around 23 they have the potential to have the most of the things the most of the aspects that make them the most desirable to men of any age when you look at the, uh, I don't know if you've looked at the data from Dataclism. There's a really great book called Dataclism. It was stats that have, and they're probably even newer, fresher stats now, but um, from, uh, was it Match.com or from the Tinder profiles and things like that, that men tend to prefer the look of, or the, you know, the appearance they find the most attractive, the age they find women most attractive is 23. It doesn't change. From 15 to 90, men find 23 year old girls they're most attractive and here's the thing men have not changed really rollo it's funny because like like women always talk about men this men that men haven't changed we we've always looked for the same things in women we've mm -hmm. always wanted a woman that's like submissive attractive young fertile etc what's really changed is women have changed because the mm -hmm. thing is that women are basically the buyers in the sexual marketplace so as they've become more and more successful they've gotten more and more access to more men and they've made more and more money they're incapable of dating down so what's happened their metrics of what an attractive mate is have changed. The days, I always say it all, all the time, the days of making you know $30,000 a year and have driving your Kia Sophia with a good insurance policy, that's not good enough anymore for a lot of women because women make their own money. So just like you say, the beta bucks is, is handled. So what's left? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. and, and that's, that's really where we have developed uh, the, uh, well, now the global sexual marketplace. It started out as a local sexual marketplace. But for, for women, it, again, it's like, is he the best I can do? Whereas for men, it's like, how many can I get? Yep. And I, I knew, you mentioned this earlier uh, in this show is like a lot of guys, they change their, but uh, you know, obviously we know this, all guys can't facilitate that mating strategy, their innate mating strategy. So they have to adapt and find ways around that. So if you're going to be in the game, you've got to find some way to adapt to it. And if you want to know why, you know, human men are more interested in things than people. If you want to know why we are the innovators and the developers and the growers and the the builders in this world, it's because we have the root of that is trying to find a way to seem like the best selection for that woman. What you did, what you described was called uh, in in uh, Evo Psych is called the strategic pluralism theory. Yes. If you are the top 10, top 20% of guys who are the naturals, like the hot guy in the foam can party, like Chad, right? Giga Chad, right? Mm -hmm. That guy would be like of the, what the, the, according to, you know, face, uh, what face maxers or looks maxers, Giga Chad would be the top 1% of guys, right? He, he just looks good. He's got everything that he's like a cartoon character of, of masculinity. So if you got that, at the, if you just say he's the, the apex of all that, then the 80% that goes on down, those guys, the 80 percenters, the blue pill guys, the beta, the beta guys, they have to find historically those guys have had to find some way to adapt if they wanted to reproduce. That's mm -hmm. why you get monogamy. That's why you get marriage. That's why you get guys who are who are uh, will, you know, there that there's some theories that say that that's what developed creative intelligence in men is if I can build a better house, if I can build, if I can do create, if I can play a better song. If I can paint a better picture, if I can build things, if I can do things that provide that show, exemplify, like confirm that I have all of these great qualities for beta bucks and, uh, and long-term security, women will, will choose me eventually. Maybe they bang so, somebody other, else, but eventually they'll pick me because I have all these great qualities and I'm a good catch. And so that's really what strategic pluralism theory is about. The guys who can't be in the 20%, the top 20%, the 80% of guys who are considered unattractive by women, they have to find some other way to solve their reproductive problems. And so what they do is they invest themselves in one woman. That's how you, got, you get guys who are like serial monogamists because it seems like the most, the easiest, most adaptive way to do it. And guess what? In 2020, we have commercialized that, that instinct, the, the uh, strategic pluralist instinct, which is I put all of my efforts into one woman, all of my reproductive efforts into one girl. I, I'm, I'm the best father. I've got a great job. I'm, I made partner. I've got all of these great things. And you want to know why I say that men's peak sexual market value 
era is right around 35, 36, 37. That's when guys have the most potential to have all of those things. They're still good looking if they stay on top of their game. They're still, you know, if, if they they still look like they have the maturity. Women tend to look for guys who are older than they are. Anywhere between three and, f- and seven years older than them. That's statistically, that's right about where it's at. And the reason for that is because years younger than me. Like all the girls I date are like eight to nine years younger than me. So you're spot on. Oh, yeah. Men who are older because men who are older, it's perceived that they have all of those things. Whether it's true or not makes no difference. The perception, the hindbrain perception is that an older man will be more mature and will have more of the things that I'm going to need in the long term and hopefully have some of the stuff that I want to have in the short term. So when I say 35, 36, that's not just some arbitrary number I pulled out of my ass. I'm saying that's the point where guys are hitting their stride. And that's the point where guys need to hold off from monogamy because that will be the point in your life where you have the most sexual selection in your life. Like you said, the candy store analogy right there. So when you get to be 35, 36, 37, maybe a little earlier, maybe a little later, depends on when you're hitting your stride. That's when you have a better judge of character. That's when you can say, I want the hot, I want the 22 year old. I want the 26 year old. I can have it now because I've got more of what, what women really find attractive, which, you know, physically, yes, but they're also looking for other qualities as well. They're looking for congruency. They're looking for dominance. They're looking for competency. They're looking for provisioning. They're looking for long-term security. They're looking for giga Chad. Yes. And the, the, the years in which you will have the most potential for those things is probably your mid thirties. And guys, Guys want to throw a rock. Like, oh, I can't believe you said that. If you go and you look at, st- and I, I look these stats up for book four, the average age of marriage since the time of the sexual revolution has gone like right around 1965, the average age of marriage was about 21 or 22 years old for men. And it was like 18 or 19 for women. Today, it's 29.8 for men and it is 28.7 for women. What, what, so what, what changed? What, what miraculous thing fell from the heavens? You know, no, it's that it's gynocentrism. It's yep. prioritizing women's mating strategy of, at the cost of men's mating strategy. And as a result, we wait longer and longer and longer and longer until we get married. And for women, that's really rough because biologically they they oh, my biological clock is ticking. No, your biological t- clock was ticking when you were 22, not yep. 28 your 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 odds of conception and carrying a pregnancy to term uh, d- decline precipitously after 29 30 years old x and i want and, and having a good healthy baby on top of that uh we got some super chats we got john from model life dating in the house <laughs> with, uh, with the with the 10,000 yen <laughs> he gave the 10,000 yen and let's see he actually uh I think that's $100 yeah that's $100 sucker <laughs> thank you John for that I appreciate it you jerk uh and then we got another super chat women walking down the street chest out phone glued to hand in furry flip-flops and revealing yoga pants symbolize the epitome of hypergamy in a world where women don't have to try facts bro this is this is that doesn't happen in Miami too much because what was that I can run with that one yeah, like, like th- that doesn't happen so much here in Miami because like Latino women put a lot of pride in how they look, but in other places, the United States, that's one thousand percent fact. Christian Matical with the four nine super chat. Speaking of Giga Chat, how come muscular men sometimes lose out to dad bod guys? My contribution to the church, but they don't have game, bro. A lot of these guys are gym cells, uh, Chris. Like that's just the reality. Um, let's see any other super chats, none. So Rolo, real quick, uh, I want to ask you one question, then we'll get into plate theory because you guys got to stay tuned and listen to the plate theory uh, thing. Me and Rolo will talk about, but you met, you mentioned the San Bergen effect earlier and I didn't want to interrupt you. What can you say as far as like women, uh, right in the CC and, you know, uh, you know, a- adopting that mating strategy, right. And basically having a lot of sexual partners, does, does that affect their ability to get in a long-term relationship in the future and be able to have a good one? Like, does it, does it really destroy their ability to pair bond or is that a myth? No, it is in, it is, uh, statistically it is inverse to their ability to have a long-term relationship. Okay. Uh, I, I can show you the numbers. A lot of people hate these numbers because the first thing they'll say, because it's unflattering to, to, to females, you know, egos and, and if particularly in a gynocentric social order. So a lot of, they'll say, oh, that's old data, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well. We, let's look at it. Let's let's look at why these things would be the way they are. Now, uh, I can show you the statistics. I actually quote them in book four. Um, for women, I think the one that the primary one that a lot of guys in the manosphere always quote is that the more sexual partners that a woman has, the uh, 
the less likely it is that she's going to have a happy marriage and the more likely it is that she's going to be divorced. So if a woman has no sexual partners before she meets, she's a virgin bride, right? She is going to report a higher incidence of happiness, obviously a lower, hopefully a lower incidence of, of sexually transmitted diseases. Guys like to throw that one out there, but I mean, today I, that's kind of a, I, that's kind of a wash, I think. But um, for, uh, if, if you have, if a woman has one, two, three, then the incidence of divorce and marital unhappiness goes up to the point where when a woman gets to be like uh, her 10th partner, the, the, it's it's down around like 22% or 32% like report a happy marriage after that. Um, for men, it's different. Men don't have that problem. And for a guy who has 100 plus notch counts, he can still have just as equally a happy a marriage as, you know, anybody I like the average, you know, is. And the reason for that is because men's mating strategy is different than women's. Because men evolved to be to ejaculate and evacuate. We can separate ourselves from the emotional investment that women put into the guy that they have sex with. So I, and I think we're kind of training women to get to that point, but then women don't realize why they can't, um, why they can't have uh, why they're, they can't live in a monogamous relationship with a guy. You want to know why poly is such a big deal right now? It's I would say it's a direct result of the fact that women f understand on some level of consciousness that they cannot be happy with just one guy. And they're always looking for that, you know, they're they're looking for they want the security still. They still want the the stand, you know, the the guy, the guy is at home to watch watch the kids, the beta male who's who's the dutiful husband, but she wants to be able to go out and and look for alphas on the weekends with their girls and a girls night out. So when we talk about poly, the rise of the popularity of poly for guys has always been in there. We, I can point back to old te the Old Testament and show you how gyno, what is it, uh, um, was it uh, poly polygyny, one man, many women, that's been around for forever. The latest invention is one woman and many men, and that's really what defines a lot of poly relationships right now. And the reason for that is because women have been taught that it they can go have the go. You can have it all. You can have it all, girl. Just do. I, I read an article about how Polly is the evolution of feminist marriages recently, and the and why is that? Well, because I think on some level of consciousness, women realize that they will not be happy with just one guy, although they know that they need that one guy. So when a woman is settling on one dude, it's usually because her attractiveness is declining and she needs to get with a guy who's going to be the good bet for the future for long-term security well in a gynocentric social order that is globalizing every day and just as you said before women don't need the beta bucks they're told from the time they're watching you know frozen mm -hmm. that they don't need you know for disney pixar whatever they're told that they don't need no man to say to come and save them when you when you learn that from the time you're five years old up till you're 30 years old and now you're realizing that you're you know your sexual market value is in sharp decline right now but yet the social order says you don't worry about it you could just have a poly relationship don't worry about it you can freeze your eggs don't worry about it girl you don't need no man and yet the the sort of the subconscious the evolved mental firmware says i really need to find somebody for for the future i need a guy who is my equal well it puts women into a really difficult spot because their mating strategy is to look for quality not yep. for quantity yep. and so when men when they say that and women think this is totally unfair they think this, i'm sure you've heard this before this is the the double standard. Women own the term double standard, right? Mm -hmm. And double standard could, can be lots and lots of things. But right. when woman says it, it only means one thing. And yep. it's usually, how come a guy can go and bang lots and lots of girls and he's a superhero? And if a girl does it, she's a slut. Yeah. Well, you know why? I, and, and there's all these funny answers like, oh, well, you know, there's a difference between a, a master key and a shitty lock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One, that one's funny. I, I, I get you. But you want to know the real biological reason for that is because women's innate mating strategy is to filter out the guys. It's to filter out the guys who are bad investments, bad bets. You want to know why we have legal safe abortion in the United States? It's exactly that. It's a fail safe against bad hypergamous choices inspired by the fact that women can have by hormonal birth control. You can have sex with anybody you want. That fundamentally changed the landscape of intersexual dynamics at an at a time where we simply weren't ready for it, and we're still seeing the results of that experiment right now. 
So when guys, you know, say, well, that's a double standard, even guys will repeat that back, right? If they'll say that that's a double standard. Well, yeah, it's a double standard because, because men and women aren't equal. What were we just saying? Because yeah. men evolved to want we say variety, but they want unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. Women are looking for quality. They're looking for the guy who is the best optimization of alpha seed and beta need. And the more that women have access to guys, the more they can become alpha widows, the more they can become, uh, the more they uh, will imprint on the guy who is the most dominant male from their sexual past. They are far more likely to be more sexual and be more willing and to get like, just to, to just to go wild with the guys in their college years, because it's free sex. And these guys, they're fun. They're the hot guy in the foam cannon party. And then they get to, you know, 29, 30, 31 years old, and they can't get that anymore. They can't lock those guys down. And so, yeah, when they lock down the guy who is the beta, the good provider, the good bet for the future, he's never going to be as exciting as the fun guy in the foam cannon party. She, that, so, yeah, they're going to be uh, more unhappy. So when women say, well, you know, when they report, you know, the more sex that they have, it's, it's two things. It's a numbers game because they have more access to guys who could have been more alpha than the dude that they actually had to settle on at some point although women aren't settling now, they don't want to, but that's why they report more marital unhappiness because the guy that they married can never measure, measure up to the fantasy of the guy that they fucked when they were in college. Yep. So, so yeah, but for men, we can dissociate ourselves from it. There is no, um, there, the emotional connection for some guys there is, but like for the most part, we can dissociate ourselves f emotionally from the sex act where women have to invest themselves emotionally into the sex act. And so when like, I know Sterling Cooper's in the, in the, in the chat, right? You know, in the house, why, not from why, dating. why do you think, again, why is pornography so popular guys? Because we can dissociate ourselves, our emotions. We don't process emotions as the same way women do. We can dissociate the emotional investment in the sex act, jerk off and go back to doing whatever the hell we were doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fact. And we don't think even twice about it, but we're expecting women now to do that. And they're not built for that. They didn't evolve for that. Their emotion that for women, when it comes, maybe they, you know, there's casual sex, of course, but they're going to emotionally invest in the guys who are the best of the best. He was the best I can do, but I married this guy who is not the best I can do. Man, that right there, guys, that you got a very good explanation as to why, <laughs> as to why um, female promiscuity hurts them in the long run with, with the evidence-backed research to it. And guys, we got 435 live viewers. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe so we can get videos like this pushed in the algorithm so more guys can hear the gospel from Mr. Rolo Tomasi and learn these uncomfortable truths. Because the thing is, is that, here's the thing, man, I always say it, like being aware and learning this stuff and, and Rolo, you say this all the time, and I truly, this is one of my favorite quote, quotes from you. You don't take the red pill to hate women. You actually take the red pill so you don't hate women for what they'll never be to you. Because a lot of guys have an idealistic view of how women should love them when in reality, you know, women love opportunistically, which, you know, that's one of the most profound things I've ever heard. And um, I think this type of information, you know, some guys, uh, you know, react to it negatively. Oh, I hate women, whatever, you know, they go black pill or they the doom pill, whatever it may be. But a lot of guys are able to internalize it, understand it, and just move accordingly, And which is where I'm at now here in Miami. I understand, you know, obviously here in Miami, hypergamy is on steroids. It is what it is. But it's allowed me to kind of just accept reality and move accordingly and adapt to the situation versus getting mad at it, which translates perfectly into plate theory, which uh, I wanted to touch on that with you. Uh, because I feel like when we talk about plate theory between the two of us, it's, it's, uh, it's awesome. So can you just give the guys a quick little summary uh and by the way guys get john's body language mastery course it closes today um get in there man you're gonna get a bunch of different <laughs> yeah use 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 any <laughs> use Rolo's link use mine either or just uh, whoever's link you want to support guys just make sure you get in there it's great you're going to get access to me Rolo tomasi rich cooper sterling cooper uh you know all of us are going to be in there giving you guys advice whether it's fitness finances uh, game, everything, man. So those Zoom calls are definitely worth it. Get in there. John's Body Language Mastery closes tonight. Please get in there. Use either mine or Rolo's link, either or. You know, we're not going to hate you either way. Support who you want. But get in there so that you guys can get the coaching. So Rolo, with that said, we'll transition over to plate theory, which I think is phenomenal. 
uh, content as far as like teaching men that they need to date non-exclusively. But can you like go I, a little bit? Sure. I I, it's, I remember when I I first came up with plate theory. It was after and and again I I have to give credit where it's due. Tom Likas actually was the one who said you know have it, you need to have multiple women. You need to have ro a roster of women. Now the way he was presenting it, of course, was to be sensational and say you need to have a lot of girls on your speed dial or whatever. <laughs> and um. And I thought about that and I go, you know, that is something that's a message. I mean, it's as raw and as, as kind of like sensational as it was, that's a message that guys need to understand. And so he, he referred to it as this is it's like, it's like spinning plates. Have you ever seen a, sp a plate spinner when he's got like the sticks and he's like spinning multiple plates yeah. on and it's like, it's almost like juggling or something like that. <laughs> Where the that's where the reference comes from so uh, so then of course we ran with that and like so women wear the plates and it, you need to keep them up and spin them and some plates will spin themselves and they spin longer and some of them will just simply fall off and you have to accept the fact that they're going to fall off but what it was was an analogy for men encouraging men to date non-exclusively so when i was like i just mentioned a, a minute ago uh strategic pluralism theory what got what guys the majority of men, the 80, 80, 85 percent of guys who are uh, have to struggle with solving their reproductive problem, which is game, which is learning PUA, which is uh, understanding women's nature, which is, you know, however you're going to apply yourself to get women and well, however you're adapting those 80, 85 percent of guys tend to be serial monogamists. They go one plate at a time because that's the way that's proper and that's that's what social a socially enforced monogamy has taught them or religion has taught them or popular culture in some way has taught them you got to do everything for her keep it fresh you got to put focus all you got to you got to make really work at a relationship all the time and then so what i did is i and i came out and i said this and people still get angry when i say this is a good relationship is basically effortless if you think about it because it means that both of you are it, it doesn't take one side whenever whenever i hear um Especially like uh, a, a celebrity, uh, Will Smith, uh, Terry Crews, these guys, they, they will they'll say, man, relationships are hard work. Yeah, for chumps like you, it is because yeah. your mindset is is focused on qualifying, qualify, qualify. And okay. when your entire you've been brought up from the time you're like five years old to qualify to women, to make them your mental point of origin, to uh, to use them as a metric for your life, then yeah. Of course it is. Relationships are really hard work because now you're now not only did you get the girl, it's even more work when you after you've got the girl. And so what that does is it, it predisposes guys to um, the serial monogamy mentality. And it took me a while to sort of break out of that. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate because back when I was in my rock star 20s, when I had gone from like, say, 18 years old until I got to be about 22 years old, I had a transition period where I, I believed the same thing. I was like, oh, you got you to gotta find the one. That's why the soulmate myth is such a big deal. It still even is today. Like, remember when eHarmony first came out? And they sold the idea that we've got your soulmate. She's right here behind this door. All you got to do is pay the, pay the fee and we've got your, here she is, you know, we've got her right here for you. Our, what is it? 72 levels of compatibility or whatever it was, right? That, that, that was our presumption. But the idea that there is one per like the one in pickup artist circles, they call it one itis. It's really the soulmate myth. It's the idea that there's only one person out there who is like the, the match for your soul who completes you. And that used to be something that women used to, to it used to be a fantasy or a, a myth amongst women. Now it's more so amongst guys today that they're looking for the one. I got I think she's the one Rolo. Can I marry her? No, you can't. You know why? Because you called her the one. That's why you can't marry her. But I, so I saw this going on and I thought, you know, dating non-exclusively is really, and if nothing else, it's an insurance policy against the idea of there only being one because the guys who I have known who have killed themselves, who have committed suicide over a girl, all subscribed to the fallacy of the one, to the soulmate myth that they can't literally, I can't live without her. How many songs use that as a lyric? Oh, I could never live without you. You know, that kind of, like the old 80s power ballads, right? Or God, listen to any Michael Bolton song, man. That's all it is, is soulmate, soulmate, soulmate. And I can't, how, can I, how am I supposed to live without you? <laughs> that whole, why was that a number one hit, you know, on the on billboard for so long? Because it resonated, man. It resonated. And so guys will they they become serial monogamous because they it's again strategic pluralism theory but they put all of their eggs in one basket and they are predisposed to what I call relational equity 
being like, I did all this. I read the, I, I did homework with the kids. I took them to soccer practice. I'm a good father. I've worked on the relationship. I made sure we got to date night. I kept it fresh. I did all this romance. I did all this stuff that Oprah and Dr. Phil and my, my pastors told me to, to do. And yet she's banging the hot guy, her, uh, her personal trainer. And she wants a divorce now. And they don't understand because they've put all of this energy and effort into one side of hypergamy. They've only put it into the side. Well, I'm going to do all these things that I'm told women want, right? I got to be her friend. I got to make her comfortable. I got to tell her I love her all the time. I got to you know, remember anniversaries. I got to all this other stuff that you know, maybe she's happy with, but the alpha seed side of it, it the more and more becomes something that women want to get with. Well, how do you, how do you, you know, insure yourself against that? Well, you have more options. Yes. And that's really what uh, plate theory is about. It's about dating non-exclusively. It's, de- it's really about how women date, right? Yeah. Because women always, what is it? The, the female, the, a woman's prerogative is to change her mind. Mm-hmm. We talked about that. Yeah. Uh, gosh, you probably heard that as far back as what was it? Uh, was it the Bobby Brown song? My prerogative. <laughs> yep. that, has been, that has been around for a very long time. Like a woman can change her mind because she's the one. Men display, women select. Yeah. Sperm is cheap, eggs are expensive. And when you separate yourself from that mindset, when you unlearn that and you actually enjoy abundance, and I didn't enjoy abundance until I got into the LA metal scene at the late 80s and the early 90s. And that's what changed my mind about women's nature because mm-hmm. now I had options and I wasn't focusing on just one girl because I had multiple girls who were interested in having sex with me or even having relationships with me. And I had to be careful of that at that time because I didn't want to get anybody pregnant and I didn't want to, uh, you know, it, was, it, it came really natural to me and I didn't understand why it was because I didn't really, we didn't have game. We didn't know anything about that, but I, I had game in that I knew what worked for me. And in a, in a way, I guess I was kind of domain dependent because I would go through certain, you know, certain process of getting with the girls that I got with, with, the, with my 40 plus notch count. And it was all during that time when I was enjoying abundance. And I've said this as well. Another thing that plate theory does is it provides a guy with confidence. Yes. And confidence. I could is, talk about that after you. I could talk about that after you go. Ahead. Confidence is derived from options. Yes. You don't go. You don't go up to your boss and say, "I want to raise." Unless you have a, a a job that you're already you have you have the confidence of the god that gave you a uh, a job offer, or maybe you want to go solo, or you've got some confidence in yourself that because you have some options, you have something else going for you, and you got the confidence to experiment, you got the confidence to be bold, to ask for what you want because you know that if yes or no, you're gonna you're gonna be out. You're gonna be okay. Right? Same thing when it comes to women. If you've got three girls, four girls in your rotation, and you're working on a fifth one, and the and she's like, mm-hmm, do this, she's she's non-productive or she's not responding, you're going to be you're you'll do this naturally. You won't even like it. Won't be something you plot. It won't be something you think out ahead of time. You will naturally manifest behaviors based on your subconscious knowledge. That, I got three other four other girls that want to bang me right now. Nice. That's during that time of my of my twenties, my early twenties. That was when I was the most bold, most experimental, most like I. Hey man, I want to have the sex that I want to have. And if you're not into it, there's three other girls here that want to have that want to do the same thing. Now I'm not saying that, of course, but my hindbrain knows that. And so my confidence, my boldness, my extroversion finds some kind of security or finds some kind of knowledge, you know, some kind of confidence, I guess, in the knowledge that I have other options. And that's why I say whenever I listen to Tony Robbins or these guys talking about confidence, you gotta de- Get down deep in your soul and bring out this confidence like it's some magical, you know, thing. Like, no, confidence comes from your competence, first of all. And then those develop into options. And those options are what makes you confident for the next challenges that come, whether that's a girl or that's a business or that's a whatever it is. So you're much more bold when you know that you have other options available to you. Man, and I'll say this real quick, guys. In the chat, I just put the Body Language Mastery signups. I put Rolo's link and mine. Support whoever you want. But you definitely want to get in before it closes tonight at midnight. Great value. With that said, um, and guys, we got 446 people watching. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Um, so to talk about what Rolo was talking about with Play Theory, I'm going to give you guys an example from my end here you know, in the dating game here in Miami. So one thing that I like to do sometimes is uh, if I'm dealing with a chick uh, regularly and she's cool, she'll let me look at her Instagram DMs and, you know, just basically she'll tell me about her dating life. And what I came to learn from dealing with like super attractive girls, especially here in Miami, is that girls 
always are talking to five to 10 different dudes at the same time, any sing, any time, you know what I mean? And mm. the thing is, is that it's just not, the women just don't talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, and the thing I always tell guys is you need to uh, be a man, but date like a woman. And what I mean by that is that women look at men as expendable commodities in the dating game. You always wonder to yourself, why did she flake? Why did she leave me on scene on Instagram? Why doesn't she respond to my text messages? Why, whatever it may be, all these different things. That is basically just actions dictating what I've always been, it, it, actions based on what I've always been saying. Women look at men as expendable commodities when it comes to dating, and it's really highest bidder wins. And the reason why they can be so fickle and flaky, et cetera, is because they're overwhelmed with options. So this is the thing, though. As a man, when you're spinning plates, the reason why it's so important to spin plates is when you do it as a man, it's unique and different. Most guys aren't capable of doing it. And furthermore, most guys aren't capable of doing it and being congruent to doing it. Because like when you tell a girl, hey, let's reschedule or you flake on her or you uh, don't tolerate her BS or you act in a manner as if like you're outcome independent versus being outcome dependent, women can smell it, man. Women are very socially receptive. They can tell if you're getting cheeks from other chicks or if you're not. And if you are getting action from other women, it's going to show in your actions because it's going to be so uh, different from what they normally deal with when they deal with guys. And I've seen like text messages and the way guys DM girls and send messages. It's very desperate. So when you are able to basically break the pattern, right, and and be like the, the – break the pattern of monotony that they deal with of all the simps in their inboxes, it's very uh, memorable. So that's why you got to spin plates because it's going to make you naturally – confident versus you faking confidence. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you guys don't fake it when you need to. That's fine. But at some point you're going to need to actually have girls because when she shit tests you or when she does things that she shouldn't be doing, you need to be able to punish her and stay congruent to that punishment based on the confidence that you derive from dealing with other women. I always say women get in line when they know you have other women in line, you know, and if you don't believe me, go listen to the future song, bitch, don't get too comfortable. Like you guys got to have it just like that. Like she's always got to be walking on eggshells when she deals with you, because that's the only way she's going to actually put some respect on my name. You know what I'm saying? So that's how you guys got to do it. Women want a guy that other men want to be and other women want to bang. Yeah, and absolutely. And so I'm, I'm looking at this right now. It's like when, when a guy Go from being kind of fat to fit when a guy actually gets in the gym and he trims down and he starts looking better and he gets some muscle definition and like that's the first thing we usually tell guys is get in the gym uh, for a, a lot of reasons not just oh if you look hotter then girls will want you well yeah that's part of it the other part is that there's like an endorphin side of it you'll feel better about yourself but the other thing is that guys don't realize this but once you start looking better and this is a subconscious it's not something that i think a lot of guys are really you know acknowledge or are like consciously cognitively aware of is that when you start looking better you start getting different uh you get different attitude from people certainly from women and i'm using this as an example because there's other ways to do this like if you have, if you have got better game you start thinking about yourself differently maybe you got a a promotion for guys when when guys experience victory when they defeat a rival when they kill another man when they they defeat a, an opponent in sports when they even when your sports team wins you get a boost in testosterone and that test and that's clinically proven that men's have higher testosterone when they you know have a victory of some sort and men who feel a defeat get a, a decline in testosterone and women pick up on that and as a result, they uh, they manifest behaviors that they haven't manifested before. So that confidence from the victory, from the knowledge of options, from the knowledge of, of competency, uh, from that stems behaviors that manifest themselves. And you might not even realize that you're doing it as a guy. Yeah. You might not even realize that you're you're manifesting things that women are picking up on that they're finding attractive. And so is it, is it your physique? Yeah, for sure. But it's also the feedback that you're getting from women that's sort of rewarding your, your limbic, you know, sensitivity to it. And then you become more confident, become more uh, experimentative, you become more bold the, and you'll do things that you, you know, gosh, was that really me? You know? Yeah. Because it's the new you. It's because you changed your mind about yourself enough to make, to initiate a change in your, in your body in your, your, whatever it is in your life. And women pick up on that and you will manifest behaviors that are attractive to women that you didn't like in your old way, in your old blue pill way of thinking, you never would have, I can't do that. She'll leave me. Yeah. I, 
is you have this you have this scarcity mentality and when you have victory when you have competency when you have options that's really the options are the basis of an abundance mindset and i know that that sounds like tony robbins crap and it is because they play it up to to an ex, to an, uh, an unusual extent let's just say but they're not wrong about the basis of it which is options victories win wins um you know the things that sort of make you more than you are builds you up to the point where you don't even realize you're displaying or you're manifesting behaviors and attitudes and mindsets and things. You change your mindset just simply based on the fact that you have this unconscious knowledge that you have options. Yeah. And that's where that confidence comes from. From that confidence stems the manifestation of behaviors that women pick up on. And it starts a positive feedback loop rather than the negative feedback loop, which is if I do that, if I, if I speak up, then if I, if I try to tell her what to wear for the date, she'll, she won't go. She won't go with me, you know, the, and that's that's a beta mentality, whereas for a, an alpha mentality, it's having the boldness to say those things, to, to, to be able to actually direct traffic in there, right, to, to, uh, to expect a woman to wear something, to, to have a plan. And today, I, I want to ask you this, though, I, I, I know we're, get, we're coming up on time, but I did want to ask you this, yeah. because, because what, what you just said about... Um, like we were talking about Instagram and is Instagram the new way of dating or something? And, and I agree that it is. And you just said that women have all these beta orbiters or they ha they're constantly getting this attention from guys unsolicited. And that builds at least the perception for women that they have options. Yeah. It's not, remember, attention is the coin of the realm in girl world, but there are different valuations of different kinds of attention. So some attention is cheap and some attention they simply don't want. The others, they're happy to keep going because it sort of feeds the ego all the time, which we live in the age of ego right now for women. But what I was going to ask you this is that when a woman is like evaluating you or is like seeing if you're like the real deal or seeing congruency, authenticity in you to see if you're like really a dominant guy or you're just actually faking it, like when women have the, the hypergamous filter, it's not just her that's doing that now. It's also her friends. It's also her mom. It's also her 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 sisters. It's also it's the sisterhood of Alice, really. And I I I thought about this while you were saying that is like back in the day when Mystery was doing his pickup artist thing, he was also talking about social proof and he was talking about pre-selection and how women will feed off of other women's approval of you or their estimation of you as to, am I going to sleep with this guy? Am I not going to sleep with this guy? Got to the point where they were saying, well, you need to go out with a female wingman. Right, so that they, so a woman sees you with an attractive woman, she thinks that that she finds you attractive, and so therefore she will find you attractive. I don't know how much I believe that, but the principle is this: is that hypergamy can't afford to just go on one woman's perception of you. They yeah. look, they're herd animals, right? That they, they, the sisterhood Uber Alice. They will go to their mom. They'll go, "What do you think of this guy? What do you think of this guy?" Like my daughter will do the same thing. If she's dating somebody, she'll send a picture of him to me or my 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 wife or you know her girlfriends. What do you think of this guy? Like that. When when there's that pre-selection and then there's the um, there's the social proof. Women look for outside approval remember what i want a guy who is, other men want to be and other women want to bang so what they're doing is they're going to their girlfriends and maybe they're not gonna say i'm gonna bang him but they want to give their sort of you know blessing of approval on that guy but now that in, back in in mysteries day it used to be this well she's going to take you or she's going to take a picture of you or she's going to have her girlfriends with you if you're opening a set or whatever she's going to consult them and she's going to you know it's not just you she, you have to win over or the girl you have to win over, it's the girls, her girlfriends that you have to win over. Now, what's changed in 2020 is that you have to win over everyone on her Instagram, uh, every one of her Instagram followers, her mom, her sisters, her girlfriends, her nephews, her nieces, or what you have to win over everybody because the 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 sort of pre-selection pool has broadened in the same way as her attention pool has broadened. Yeah. And I'll say this too. Shout out to John from Bulldog Mindset. Confidence is knowing the possible outcomes and knowing no matter what you'll, outcome, you'll be okay. That's 1000% facts. John's a good friend. Shout out to Rolo for breaking down female nature in the smoothest way possible. Help me understand women and maintain my plates longer. Great panel. Chris is a friend of mine. He's actually here in Miami. Uh, he was over here like last week chilling with me. And then we got another one. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. If I, man, so I need super chats when you want to find them is so hard. Okay. Thanks for the, uh, for the great content and striving to grow with the $5 super chat. Thank you so much. So I'll say this man about pre-selection. I always say having girls is basically 
passive dem passive DHV income. And for the guys that don't know, demonstration of higher value. So like when you have girls with you, like it's automatically going to co-sign you, especially if you, and I always tell guys, if you want to deal with like strippers, attractive girls, hired guns, chicks that like get paid for their beauty, you typically are going to need another hot girl with you because hot girls speak hot girl language. If she sees you with an attractive woman, she's like, okay, this guy's legit. And there's no, because uh, I always say like, if you have money or you have clout, a blue check mark, whatever it may be, these are attractive features, but there's nothing like having a girl with you that actually personifies that you're genuinely attractive. Having these traits, woman can maybe assume it, but when she sees a hot girl there, now it's 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 set in stone that you're an attractive male. And just by her seeing you with another woman, she's going to think you're attractive. The reason why Dan Blazarian gets so many girls is because he already has girls. Because I always say, if you could pick one thing that you can have like as an attraction trigger, we all know there's a bunch of different attraction triggers. Leader of men, height, uh, uh, to physical attractiveness, physical fitness, um, you know, uh, you know, protector of cared ones. M Mystery broke all this down, which I suggest all you guys read that book because his um, his theory is spot on as far as like being an attractive man, even though his application is a bit dated, but his theory is great. And one of the things is pre-selection. And the thing is, is that when you have women with you, other girls understand that like, okay, this guy's probably not going to be desperate and this girl's co-signing on him. So I'm going to deal with him. And I notice. When I have like a girl that I'm chilling with or whatever it may be, I get way more looks from other women than if I were by myself. And the reason why is because, you know, girls just understand that if a guy's able to have a girl with them, especially a hot one, they're gonna be like, oh, okay, this guy's actually attractive. It's like proof in the pudding. Cause like, like, like say me and Rolo are walking down the street, right? And I see a hot chick. I'm not gonna look to Rolo and be like, hey man, what do you think about her? What do you like? Okay, you know, like I mean, I might shoot with the shit with him or whatever and be like, what do you she's hot? Men have different uh, uh attraction and arousal criteria than than women do. That's why exactly. So if Rolo tells me, yeah, okay, let's go. I'm yeah. in. <laughs> like, like if Rolo told me, hey, I don't I don't think she's hot, but I'm like, I think she's hot. I'm gonna go approach her anyway. Like, I'm not gonna care about his opinion. Men don't need, you know, a cosign from other men to go and deal with women. However, women do. So if you're if you're that's why I always say when you're like doing night game or you're talking with chicks, you need to disarm her friends immediately. And what I mean by that is you need to kind of address the problem before it becomes a problem. So when you open up a set and you're talking to girls, you you open up your girl and talk to her. But you, at some point in the interaction, you need to introduce yourself to her friends and show that you're a cool, normal guy so that they don't come in and cock block you. The reason why cock blocking is so powerful with women is because even if a girl likes you, if her friends don't co-sign on you, she'd rather deal with them because she can't face the ostracization next day at brunch when she leaves and bangs you versus her friends uh, co-signing. So a woman's reputation is always going to come before her getting some temporary gratification from having sex with you, no matter how hot you are. So I always say you need to address the problem, make the friends at least um, respect and know that you're a normal guy. Because a lot of guys make the mistake and they just ignore the chicks altogether or worse yet, they try to fight with the girls. And the mm -hmm. thing is that you're always going to lose doing that because no matter how much she likes you, if it's a first interaction, she's going to defer to the, what they think because women can't deal with being ostracized from their friends like men can. And that comes from like years and years of them being, uh, you know, needing other people around them to survive because women are the more vulnerable sex, man. It's only been the past hundred years or so that they've been able to survive. Without well, the I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because that's the the security side of the beta buck side of hypergamy is something that transfers over to the sisterhood to to their girlfriends and so like hypergamy like remember that women's window for their peak sexual market value years is very short but it goes like you said that candy store they get in there and then they're they're there before anybody else but then they get kicked out of it later on right they they it, women's uh sexual market value oh, peak burns hot and bright and then it goes out for men it's sort of this long steady b slow burn up to the brightest point and then a slow steady burn out and that's just simply the nature of men and women but I, evolution has sort of wired into women's brains to have this sort of subconscious knowledge that they don't have that much time like why, why else would there be such a thing as uh, like it's a myth but why would they think of things in terms of like the maternal instinct or uh the biological clock yes there is a biological clock it burns a lot quicker than it, it times out a lot faster than most women will will a lot will admit but there is such a thing like there's this knowledge that their that their sexual market value is perishable so and if it was if that wasn't true then you can explain to me why the uh, cosmetic industry is a multi-bazillion dollar industry trying to make women look younger 
I always say that. So we'll never go out of business. The, the makeup industry will never go out of business because of that. Sorry, go ahead. Not, the, the cosmetic industry is not a multi-bazillion dollar juggernaut because women want to look older. <laughs> it's because they want to look younger. Because why? On some level of consciousness, women realize that their only real agency in life is their sexuality and that sexuality is perishable. And so that's why they consult their girlfriends. That's why they get approval. It's, uh, it's again, it's that communitarian, psychological, uh, in, innate psychology that goes to the group that goes to the women that says okay uh, we need some solidarity here girls let's consult the sisterhood is he acceptable or is he not acceptable whether it's just three girls in a club or it's it's a worldwide consortium on the web that's how that's what women default to because innately they know that they don't have that much time and so they have to make a good decision based on the information that they have at that moment. And hopefully they make a good bet for themselves for long-term security, as well as mating with the, the best guy who would be the funnest guy to have sex with. Now, the, I'm looking in the, the chat here because a lot of guys, I, I think they're talking about, you know, this is dread. Well, yeah, it is. It can become dread game. But it's also about what I mentioned in my first book, which is competition anxiety. Yes. So not only are women consulting each other about the acceptability of that guy over there, they're also competing for that same guy. Yeah. So if if he's better than the guy that they're with, maybe they don't want they don't want their girlfriend to get that guy. Or you want to know why women really uh, backstab very attractive women, or they call them like uh, they try to disqualify them. Like if you've ever been in a, a group of girls, <clears throat> like at a club or a social situation, and there's like five or six of them, and you're there and you're watching this happen. And a girl walks in, she's in a red dress and high heels and tits out to here and blonde hair. And she's just like, you looking for it. Right. I mean, just really hot girl. The first thing the girls in that group will do is they'll go like, fact, she, she wore that only sluts wear that, you know, yep. or something along those lines. Right. And she walks out of the room and then they talk shit about her and blah, blah, blah. Why? Why is that? Because they're consulting the community about a superior competitor to any of the girls that are in that community. And like guys will be like, like I, I've done this before. Like when a girl will come up, like one of my poor girls will go, did you see that, that dirty look that bitch just gave me? I'm like, I was right here. I didn't see any dirty look, but they pick up on those things. Remember I talked about manifesting behaviors. Oh man. If you think they're, they're sensitive to behaviors from guys, they're even 300 times more sensitive to those kinds of behaviors in women. So you could be in the same room. And the girl walks out and your other girl says, did you see that dirty look that bitch just gave me? Yeah. And I'm like, no, should I have? You know, and but that's the level of sensitivity to that kind of communication, the subcommunications that they have, because they have to consult other people to get information from what's going on. You want to know why gossip is a sin, mostly for women? Because that's what they're doing. It's data collection. And we say that it's improper for you to do it in this way. That's gossip. But women are doing that all the time, whether it's a talk show or it's on social media or it's in a club or wherever it is, they're always gathering information of some sorts. So, and why? Because they're looking for confirmation on their estimation of that person, but whether it's a guy or girl, and they're also looking for like approval, of course, because they're herd animals. They're commu I, I hate it when guys say, though, they're herd animals. No, they're communitarian. That's primarily what women are. They're primarily in, when it comes to their psyches, they evolved to be collectivist because that was survival for them for so long. We, we have to, the village, we have to inter be interdependent on one another. And if we don't, we could die. So that's, that's part of it as well. And then the last part of it is that um, it's the competition side. So yeah. can I get this guy? Because what, the, what women are doing when they see the hot girl in the red dress, they're trying to disqualify her from any of the surrounding guys or even amongst themselves, any of the uh, surrounding guys' uh, consideration for getting with her. So yeah. what they're saying is she might look good, she might be hot, she might be uh, advertising her sexuality, unlimited access to unlimited sexuality, she might be advertising her interests, but she's not a good bet for you guys because that kind of girl is a slut. She's the kind of girl that, what is a slut? A cuckold. She will cuckold you. She will have some other guy because she's a sleep around girl. She will have sex with some other guy. This is the, uh, the uh, overt message. She'll have so sex with some other guy and she'll have his kid and she'll tell you that it's yours, but you're a stupid idiot because all you do is think with your dick and woman, is it's another way that women can shame guys. Yes. But they're all disqualifying her as a competitor, as a intersexual, intrasexual competitor 
in within their own group. That's why women hate gold diggers. We call we say, well, all women are gold diggers. Yeah, but the ones that we call gold diggers are the ones that give away the game. Yes. They're the ones that say, this is it's really about transaction. It's really about this. But we can't have she's too overt about it. She's too in your face. Yep. So we can't. We're going to call her a gold digger and we're going to disqualify her from men's consideration for long-term security and marriage and babies and, and all that other stuff in the future. So you got these women who are just backstabbing each other, but at the same time, they're still seeking validation and they're seeking confirmation about other things from women as well. That's the communitarian sisterhood Uber Alice. And, and that was a great explanation. I'll tell you guys this. It's, it's hilarious too, because when women make fun of other women, the thing they always attack first is her, basically her being promiscuous because women know deep down that men are repulsed by girls that are promiscuous. Even the most sexually liberated chick is still going to say, oh, I'm not a hoe. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I'm not promiscuous like that. I, I'm still like a good girl because I always say women are purity dealers. So, and their ability to lock down a high value guy is contingent upon their ability to sell purity to you so that you can commit to them. So other girls are always going to hit them where it hurts. Women are looking for security. So what are chicks going to do? Oh, she's a hoe. You probably shouldn't want to deal with her. She gets around. She had a train ran on her. And she, women know when they say these trigger words to men, guys are like, oh, okay. Like I ain't going to take her seriously. I'm just going to have sex with her. And the girls are like, oh, gotcha. And it's funny too, because women fought so hard for sexual liberation to keep from being, um, you know, demonized for being promiscuous. But who uh, shames women the most? It's other women that shame each other the most each when other. it comes to promiscuity, not men. And people say, oh, guys, you guys are like misogynists. They talk crap about girls that are promiscuous. I love promiscuous girls. This is awesome for me. Like it, it, this is the marketplace. But it's other women nine out of ten times that shame other women. And this guy has a good question here, too. What do you think about this? Get your wingman to pull the girls, pull the girl's friend a few minutes after and pretend not to know them. I mean, dude, you're probably better off just having your friend with you because it shows social proof on your end. You know what I mean? When you're with, with friends and you have a guy with you, it shows that you're like at least not completely weird. You know what I'm saying? So like I would use that to my benefit uh, and introduce him. But here's the thing. Having a bad wingman is going to mess you up. So I'll tell you this. We're actually going to do a video, uh, uh, a show probably on Tuesday, the five, the t uh, 10 signs to uh, get a good wingman and how to become a good wingman. So tune in on the Fresh and Fit podcast for that. But uh, do we have any other super chats? And then you also mentioned one other thing, Rolo, that I really like. Oh, here's another super chat. Five dollars super four ninety nine. Myron, what are the best hotels and pools on South Beach right now? SLS is definitely the best place to go, but it's not open right now. Do not come to Miami right now, guys. We still have on lockdown eleven p.m. curfew. But if you want to do the best pool party in Miami, SLS Miami Beach. Get there before eleven a.m. When you see the French dude, argue him down. Uh, he's gonna try to charge you one fifty or whatever. Tell him I'll do hundred, and then that'll go towards your drinks. You're welcome. Uh, and then, <laughs> and then, oh, so Rolo, you mentioned something really great about um, competition anxiety, and mm -hmm. um, one way that we can personify this. Uh, what I tell guys is when you're in clubs and you want to run like, uh, you, you got two options. You can either go to a nightclub and like go out and like cold approach chicks or whatever, or you can get a table and get table game. And the reason why a table game works so well, when I'm gonna describe how to do it, guys is it's going to create competition anxiety. So what you do is you get a table with you and your friends, whatever it may be, you get the bottle. You get one guy that's holding on to the bottle, one guy there with him. And then you could take your two most charismatic guys or you can send a bouncer to do this for you and they're going to go source girls. And what you do is you go get two sets, three sets, and you get different groups of different women from different, you know, you don't get like a big bachelorette party of 10 girls. You don't want to do that. You need to get different girls that don't know each other. And when you bring these women in two, three sets, maybe even a four set, and they're sitting in your VIP your buddy's pouring the liquor for them so they don't touch the bottle, obviously, because if you do, they're going to come in and drink all your stuff. What you're doing is you're basically letting all the other girls see girls they don't know, and they're like, oh, what's going on here? And then, more importantly, when you're screening the girls out to see who's actually available you know, to hook up, and a chick says, oh, no, I have a boyfriend, and she does anything like that, and you know she's simply there to just drink your liquor for free, you kick her out and you make sure the other girls see that. And when they see that, that you have no problem kicking girls out that don't comply – they're going to behave much better to stay at the VIP because for girls, being in the VIP portion of a club is very important to them for a social perspective so they can sit down because they're wearing heels. And then on top of that, so they can have access to liquor and it's a status thing. So what you need to do is leverage that in your favor and let them know that they're expendable. Just like I always tell you, you need to treat women as expendable just like they treat men as expendable. It's just politically incorrect to treat women as expendable, even though you should be doing it as a man too. So when you do this, the other chicks are going to comply and you're going to actually make yourself more attractive. So that's like uh, competition anxiety done in like a nightclub setting if you want to run table game. Uh, 
but yeah, I mean, Rolo, anything else you wanted to add before we close this? I, one? I was going to say is I, I know a lot of guys get into dread and they, they think that that's, I, I've, I have written quite extensively about dread and it sort of dovetails into the competition anxiety because all dread is pretty much based on competition anxiety. Yeah. Um, I, I get it from both sides because a lot of guys think that dread is it works really good when you're single, but it's like you can't do you can't you run dread when you're married. And it's like, no, you can. You just don't have the opportunities to do it like when you when you're in a relationship or you're married or whatever. But uh, dread is this is there's two kinds of dread. There's overt dread and there's passive dread. Passive dread is the one you want to encourage and you want to sort of foster. Overt dread is kind of like. Oh man, if you don't shape up, if you don't wear that lingerie, you don't do what I tell you to do. You're, I'm out of here, bitch. Like, there's a lot of girls I want to bang me. Like that, that overt dread, like putting it right there in their face. That it can be effective. It just depends on what your relationship's about. But like a lot of guys think that they, you know, that that's that's like overt dread is from like men's basic form of communication, which yep. is we should say what we mean and mean what we say, right? I'm going to give her an ultimatum. Passive dread is much more effective because what passive dread does is it show like you got most guys don't have the they don't have the patience and they don't have the art for this, which right. is if uh, if a, if a, if you're with your girlfriend or you're with your wife or whatever and you're at a, 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 a I don't know a bar or you're at a, a restaurant or something and the waitress flirts with you for whatever reason don't dissuade it go with it don't I, you don't have to go hey baby I'll, let's give me get your number you don't have to like do that but if you go with it. What you're doing is you're you're fine. You have a an opportunity to display higher value, but you also have an opportunity to display pre-selection. Most guys who get into relationships, particularly beta guys who settle on some girl, or guys who get into a marriage and they, you know, oh, I can't, she won't have sex with me anymore. Well, the reason why she says that or she does that is because she's devalued you. You're you're basically valueless to her because nobody else wants you. And you're, you're, um, so when you are in a position where you can foster passive dread or her girlfriend say, Oh man, uh, Rolo's is looking good. Mrs. Tomasi. What's he been doing? Working out more. You like with those kinds of things, that's passive dread. It's like third party dread that stokes a woman's imagination. Mm -hmm. That is. A, a form of dread that is much more like passive dread, soft dread is what I called it is much more effective than overt dread because it's not you like trying to do it. It's not contrived as opposed to it's happening organically. I've also said that, um, and I've got, this is in book one, but it's, it's a title of a chapter called Just Get It. And women want a guy who just gets it. They want a guy who doesn't have to be told to be masculine, who knows he's attractive, who knows he's, he's like, oh, he has such confidence. Yeah, well, because he gets it. He understands your nature. The guy, the most, the best, like I said, the, the best relationships are effortless. And it's usually because the guy understands women's nature enough that he doesn't have to like talk about it. Like women don't want to talk about the game. They want to play the game. They don't want, that's why gamma male guys, they go, well, you know, I should be the guy that you really go for because I've got X, Y, and Z. And you say you want all these things and I'm really that guy, but you keep fucking Chad in the hot, in the phone cannon party. I can't understand why. Like that guy, he doesn't understand because he's trying to use logic and reason, appealing to a woman's reason rather than her emotions. Yeah. The guy who just gets it already understands that. He already understands that that's that's what she's going to be doing and he's the, he doesn't have to make contrived date nights she's she wants to have sex with him because he's he's the guy that she's the, the best opportunity for her is yeah. he the best i can do women make rules for betas and they break rules for alphas so if you're i, I i've called that the rosetta stone of game mm -hmm. if a woman is making rules for you odds are she sees you as a beta odds are she sees you as a, a, a means of support a foodie call, right? She she right. sees you as a provider, a security provider. She if if she's making you jump through hoops, like I said, if oh, any any time was Iron Rule Tomasi number three. Anytime a woman makes you wait for sex, the sex is never worth the wait. That doesn't mean go have go bang as many random hoes as you can. That does not mean that. What that means is it's genuine desire. When a woman makes you wait for sex, there's something that is mitigating that decision to have sex because women will break rules for alphas. They won't have those same rules for the guys that they banged when they were in college or on spring break in Cancun. They they don't th those don't apply to the guy who is uh, so far above them in sexual market value, who is a one time shot. Exactly. That they, they will throw all caution to the wind just to have the sexual experience with that alpha. Royce said this: five minutes of alpha trumps five years of beta. Facts. And so, here's the thing too. I Guys. You get to be 30 and you married that girl, that five minutes she spent fucking that guy in Cancun, that's that trumps all five years that you just put into your marriage. 
absolutely. And I tell guys this all the time. You need to hold yourself to a higher standard. If a chick is making you wait for sex, you need to think to yourself, would she make Drake wait for this? No, she wouldn't. Okay, I need to act accordingly and kick her out of my place. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't ever, guys, let a woman leverage sexu se her sexuality against you in return for some kind of compliance. Oh, you need to take me out on more dates. Oh, I don't feel comfortable yet. Or like, I, I, I uh, whatever it may be. Like, I, I need you to like take me out on more dates or spend more time with me. Get me this. Get me that. Once she starts like trying to dangle a carrot in front of you, then you already know that you're not the best in her eyes, and you need to act accordingly. And punish her for that. And what I mean by that is not like like spank her or some weird shit. No, retract attention. Like, okay, cool. You are 100% within, just like Barbie Brown, within your prerogative to not have sex with me. But I'm also within 100% of my prerogative to kick you out and find a girl that will. So don't let a girl sit there and siphon attention from you and validation, etc. Because if a girl gives you last minute resistance and doesn't want to have sex in the bedroom, right? And she like fights back, cool. Get up, let her have that free, let her have... um. Let her obviously withhold her sex. That's fine. Obviously, you don't rape anybody. That's that's not the way you want to go. But you need to let her know that I'm going to retract my attention. And I'm going to find a girl that will. You know what I'm saying? You don't sit there and reward the good behavior and cuddle with her after she gives you last minute resistance. Because at the end of the day, a lot of guys hide their dick. They're scared to tell a woman what they want. And they're afraid more, even more so, they're afraid to insert boundaries when a woman doesn't give them what they want. A lot of guys sit there and think, well, it's her body, her choice. That's true. But it's also your attention, your choice too. So you got to hold her to some kind of standard as well. And you got to think to yourself every single time, would she do this to a rapper, a celebrity, an athlete, whatever? If the answer is no, then you need to figure out why and punish her accordingly and go deal with a girl that's going to give you the yes. Simple and it doesn't have to be, I was going to say, and it doesn't have to be like overt punishment. Well, I'm, I'm not saying you won't fuck me, so I'm going off over here. Yeah. You, you, no, you, you uh, was it demonstrate, do not explicate. Do I demonstrate if you have boundaries like guys are what how do I establish boundaries? You you demonstrate them. You don't go, well, if you do this, then I'm going if you go off to the girls' night out in Vegas, I'm gonna be gone, baby. You don't say that. You say, Yeah, go right ahead, because the issue isn't her asking you permission for girls' night out. It is the fact that she it came into her mind that that's a good idea to do, that that's what she really wants to do. It's right. not about permission, it's about the fact that she even considered it in the first place. That right there tells you what you need to know. Act accordingly. You say, "Oh well, I have boundaries. Great. Let's let's demonstrate those boundaries." She comes back, and all her shits on the sidewalk. That's the boundary. Here it is. The the boundaries closed now. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so there's there's that side of it. I was also going to say is that um, when you're talking about um, when you're talking about just get it. When you're talking about like guys who don't pick up on on stuff like when, when it comes to uh, the first. Like, like I say, well, what's a shit test? How do I, how do I pass a shit test kind of thing? The guy who just gets it understands the shit test from, from the beginning. Often the first shit test a woman will give you is, will you comply? Will you, if I give you rules, will you comply? Because an alpha wouldn't comply. An alpha wouldn't even have the conversation. I, yeah. got, I need to feel comfortable with you. Okay. You can go feel comfortable with somebody else because I've got other options and I'm confident enough to that. I, even if I don't, I'm confident enough. I can go and generate them because I've done so in the past. So when you have that confidence that comes from competency and options that manifests in what we would call an alpha behavior, yeah. uh, alpha guy that she breaks rules for that, that conversation doesn't happen for that guy. Ah, yeah. I need you to take me out more. I need you to buy me this. I mean, we need to go. Or, or it, it's, for a lot of women, they don't say that to you. I need you to do this. I need you to be more comfortable. It's usually death by a little, little tiny little knife, right? It's a, it's a little teeny tiny shit test because if you fail that shit test you fail one after that and another after that, what those shit tests are, are you compliant? Because an alpha male who has options and who has, who is the kind of guy that other men want to be and other women want to bang, that guy doesn't take that. That guy doesn't, it doesn't even enter his thought process. He's already with four other girls because he already knows that she has, he has options. That's why they will break rules for those kinds of guys because he has that high value. There's an urgency. There's an anxiety. If I don't bang this guy, I'm not going to be able to get him. That's where the, that's the, remember I said, when a woman is 23, when she hits her peak, uh, you know, hypergamous, uh, her peak sexual market value, she can't afford to wait. So yeah. if the, if the if she gets a winning lottery ticket, spread the legs and let's have the winning lottery ticket because that says to her, you know, limbic system that he's the best that she could possibly do. And so she gets with that guy. So all the rules fly out the window. 
So is that woman making rules for you or is she breaking rules for you? And then are you following those rules or are you, are you just simply demonstrating and not explicating? You're just saying, okay, well, screw it, whatever, I'm out. Is that you or are you the guy who will pander to that? We'll go, okay, well, she needed to be comfortable. So I had to take her to, to Bible study. And then we spooned on the, on her couch for a little while. And, and, you know, it'll happen later. You know, we got to be friends first and rapport. No, that, that guy who she does that with is not the guy she breaks rules for. That's not the guy she has marathon sex with like she did with the guys that she had when she was in college and broke all of those rules for. When women get to be in their epiphany phase, this is especially intense for women in their epiphany phase because something in their head says, I got to get with a guy who is not the best I can do. But if I have to do that, then he has to jump through all these hoops. Yep. So I know he's good for, you know, dependable. He's loyal. He's going to be a good father. He's going to protect me. He's parentally invested. He's a good provider, yada, yada, yada. And I have to make him jump through these series of hoops because if I don't do that, then I, then I can't convince my, you know, hedonistic id part of my brain that I really want to get with the fun guy that I had back in college. But I, but, you know, reality dictates that I must get with this guy who is the better choice right now for the long term. She has to sort of, have this conversation, the ego and the id, where it's like, well, I really want to get with the hot guy. He's fun. And then the ego says, no, no, no. We got to be with the guy who's a good bet. We got to, you know, we can't, we're not going to be hot forever. No, no, no. I really want the hot guy in the phone counterpart. No, no, no. We got to get with this guy. And that, so that process of just like this inner conflict, this inner conversation between the, between those two, usually, hopefully right around 29 to 31, that's when the ego wins out. But you lose as a guy if you're dumb. If you don't know any of this, if you're if you're red pill unaware, if you're if you're still blue pill, and if you have it, if you don't realize that that's the game that's being played with you, and most women will say they'll come up with some some rationalization like I want to get right with God, I want to do it right this time, yeah, so I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you, yeah, I I, I really want to have sex with you, but I need you to make me feel comfortable and let me know that you're the one and. No, no, that's not the case. If 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 Jason Momoa walked in and that that there would be no that conversation wouldn't happen. So yeah, quick it, roll too after go ahead, go ahead. I'm, that's fine. <laughs> so what I was gonna say was so guys we uh guys please we got 446 live viewers. Please like the video, comment, subscribe to the channel. I got some good game for you guys right here because I'm gonna again as you guys see Rolo's giving you guys a theory. I'm gonna give you guys the real time application. So for you guys out there, there's this woman, okay? I want you to Google after after the show, after this awesome stream between me and the Godfather. I want you guys to go on YouTube and search a woman named Selena Powell, okay? And she has a whole series of how to uh, DM and get with rappers, okay? So this woman is teaching women how to deal with high-value men, rappers, athletes, etc. okay? Teaching girls how to slide in their DMs, how to get a hook, uh, to hook up with them, whatever it may be. And this woman has made a career off of having high, having sex with celebrities, et cetera, high value men. You want to know what her first tip was when she met, when she uh, did her episode? The first tip she gave was do not slide in a rapper's DMs and then show up at his a hotel and not be about it. Because if you if you're not about it, they're gonna kick you out immediately. And what does that what does that go to show? It goes to show that alpha males don't wait for a chick to give them sex, man. They don't. They they'll say. Are you in or are you out? If you're out, you're out the hotel. I don't care because I have other girls. And the thing is, guys, is that you have to hold yourself to that same standard. You have a woman here that literally only deals with high value men, and she understands the consequences of dealing with these level of men. And she knows that if I don't give it up, this guy's going to kick me out. So that's why you guys can't afford to sit there and let a chick use you for free attention or whatever, because she's going to make rules for you. Whereas she's going to meet with Chris Brown in the back and she's going to be sucking him in the, uh, sucking him dry without even questioning it. You know what I'm saying? Because women will 100% not wait if they find the guy attractive enough and you need to be that guy. So that's what I just had to, to touch mm -hmm. on what Rolo was saying, like, because that's 100% true, guys. Well, hypergamy can't afford to wait on an ideal opportunity. That's why. Yeah. You want to know why women break rules for alphas? It's easy to say why they make rules. Why do women break rules for alphas? Why do they get with their hot guy and suck off the rapper or whatever? It's because, on again, on some level of consciousness, women realize that hypergamy can't afford to miss opportunities like that. Yeah. This guy's great. If I can get him off, if I can keep him. You want to know why fat chicks try the hardest in bed? 
is because of exactly that dynamic. If I don't prove to this guy that I'm the best sexual experience that he's, I know I'm overweight and I can't compete with these other girls, but I have to find some way to outperform these girls. Why did they try harder in bed? That's why they try harder in bed because they cannot afford, hypergamy cannot afford to miss an ideal opportunity when it's right there in their face. It's the best thing that they've ever, yes, he is by far the best guy I could ever get with, right? So imagine you're the guy I keep, I know I keep referring back to the, you know, the, the hot guy in the foam cannon party, but if you're the girl who gets with the guy who was the hot guy in the foam cannon party and you're going to try to start a relationship with, that's why I call it alpha widows because she's widowed by the guy who was the best dude that she could ever get with. And you're not even close to that because you'll do the, all these, you'll go, you'll jump through the hoops. You'll obey those rules. You'll do those things that this guy never would have dreamed of doing. Because he was hot, you know, I he, he was cute, I was hot, and or whatever, and he, one thing led to another. I was drunk, <laughs> and so what the the basis of that? I know I keep using that as sort of like a euphemism, or I, we laugh about the that sort of scenario, but it's because hypergamy can't afford to wait. If a winner rolls up, you go with the winner. You got it. That's the if that's the best if that and the opportunity presents itself, you you don't make rules for a guy like that. You just go with it. And the guys who are by order of degree, like not that guy, like a little bit, little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less. Those are the guys that get a little bit more rules, get a little bit more, you know, uh, litmus tests for them to sort of jump through before she spreads her legs. Because that's that's essentially that's the hypergamous filter. That's women's intuition. They want to say it's feminine intuition. What it is is it's a a fail safe. It's like a psychological mechanism that women use against what's their uh, existential fear. The existential fear is to mate and reproduce with a guy who she thought was alpha, who was actually very much a beta, but tricked her into thinking that he was alpha. And oh my God, I had sex with this guy. I emotionally invested in this guy. He's not who he said he was. And that is the worst possible thing that can happen to a woman. That's basically rape because what happens is it's removing hypergamous control. She had hypergamy. She was controlling her hypergamy to the point where it's like she make you jump through these lists. She's trying to figure out, are you? Are you really the guy that I think you are? That kind of stuff. And you get to that point and you, she realizes, oh my God, he's really beta. I'm screwed. And in the in the past, in our evolutionary past, that could be a death sentence for a woman. If they, she had sex with the guy who wasn't going to stick around or wasn't who he said he was, that could be a death sentence because they're the most vulnerable sex. Now she's saddled with a guy uh, and then prior to uh, on-demand abortion, prior to hormonal birth control, all of the, all the things that made a guy valuable the reason why they're different now is because of that hypergamous filter, because of female intuition. I could die if I have sex with the wrong guy. My life could be ruined if I have sex with the wrong guy who tricks me into thinking he's one guy and he turns out to be the next guy. When the guy comes in and he is 100% everyone on planet Earth says he's famous, he's good looking, he's got lots of money, he is who he says he is. Everyone on planet, you want to know why fame is such a, is so seducing for women or even the appearance, the perception of fame is because that guy is confirmed, confirmed 100% alpha, 100% has money, 100% has all these things. And so when a woman sees that, her hindbrain says, I can't afford not to bang this guy. I can't afford not to get him off. I can't afford not to do that. So that's why rock stars have like the string of women left and right because he's confirmed money, status, creativity. If he's a rock star, I, I, it, it perceptually wise anyways, he's got all this stuff going for him. It's all confirmed. It's 100%. Here it is. This is the dude. She's not going to go. I'm sorry, Paul Stanley. I, I I need you to be. I need to be comfortable with you first before I have sex with you. And there's a line of 20 girls outside this, you know, the backstage area that are going to bang that guy. You, you don't do that. You do what you do. That's what women do. It's the most pragmatic and efficient way to solve a reproductive problem. Hopefully, you get pregnant, and then you got him on the hook for for forever. And that's yeah. how. It works. And anyway. this was. Rolo, this was an awesome stream, man. Uh, I know we went a little over, but I know guys were just giving yeah. emojis all over the place. Um, hey, Medsala, I saw your question here, dude. DM me on the side, dude, because we got to close up shop, but I'll answer this question for you on how to be more. His question is, late 20s and financially good. Often girls in my country, uh, Africa, see me as attractive rather than arousing. What to do about that? Hit me up uh, on the side, dude, on my Instagram, Unplug Fit, uh, and we'll get that. We'll get you sorted on that because we got to close up shop. Rolo's giving us two and a half hours of his time and the guy has a book to write, guys. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, Rolo, can you tell, tell them where they can find you, talk about your books, and uh, and I'm going to put your stuff in a chat too as well while you do it. Go ahead. 
I do, uh, as most of you probably already know, I do, uh, um, I do two, uh, uh, mainly two YouTube shows every week on my own channel, which is uh, just uh, YouTube. It's a rational mail. Just look it up. Uh, and, uh, so that I do that on Sundays and Wednesdays. Uh, I also have the, the last remaining, uh, blog in the red pill, which is the, the rational mail.com. I haven't done much with it, uh, in the last month because I've been focusing primarily on the book, but I, that's usually where I'm most active. And so I have, uh, seven years of, of essays and posts and things there that you can sort of get into. Um, so that's, and that's been around, like I said, since 2011. So there's, there's a wealth of knowledge in there. So that is the rational Uh, I am the author of three books, the rational mail series of books. You can find those on Amazon. Just type in the rational mail in the search engine. You'll find everybody there. I put the link to the book in the chat, go get it. It's only eight 99. Like guys, that eight 99 will save you thousands of dollars and, and possibly even your life. I give uh, learning. Give. <laughs> well, that. I give and I give and I give. <laughs> uh, and then I also, uh, you can find me on Twitter. I am Rolo Tomasi at Rational Mail if you have any questions. And of course, you already know that I'm on Rule Zero every Saturday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern. Yeah, guys, I just spammed this book in the chat. It's literally, I'm looking at it right now. It is $8.99. It's 1,000% worth it. Get it on Audible. Get, it, uh, get a couple of copies of it. Give it to your sons. Give it to guys that need to figure this stuff out. People, men you care about, man. Because like, this book is going to change a lot of guys' lives. So they can, and remember, guys, uh, Roll always says this, and I, lo I love this quote You don't learn this information to hate women. You learn this information to prevent hating women for what they'll never be to you, man. So definitely get the book, Rolo. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This was awesome. We got to do this again, man. I think people really enjoy yeah. the, yeah. And the application breakdown. So, um, yeah, man, guys, we'll catch you uh, tonight at 10 p.m. on Mr. Lucario's channel. We're going to talk about. Uh, well, we'll find a cool topic. We'll tell you guys a topic soon, but in the game podcast, Lucario's channel, 10 p.m., patreon.com slash fresh fit. I'll catch you guys on the next one. Thank you for tuning in. Peace.